because Rod was saying uh, test one two. I don't really need it to be that loud in the room, but as long as you're getting an okay volume, I, it'll probably be quieter now because I've turned it down on the board. But is that you need a little bit more? Okay, so about there. Is that that's good? Okay. Yeah, because it doesn't doesn't need to be deafening in the room, but as long as you guys are getting it. because I didn't realize that they actually had Chrome installed on laptops. It was buffering like crazy. It looked like the stream was at like three frames a second until you muted the stream. And then it was playing at a normal bit rate. And I cannot let you figure out why that happened. Because audio should not affect video quality. Yeah, it was just so strange. But once I took the product side, but I just, I panicked because I had to run to every room and be like, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. This room comes up first.
Welcome to the biology and medicine track here at Julia Khan. Um, our first talk today is going to be uh, Alex Long. You're talking about MRI compress, compressed sensing and denoising in Julia. So there you go. Um, so yeah, I'm Alex. Uh, this is my first ever conference talk. Um, first time in the US, so lots of firsts. Um, I'm, trying to learn compressed sensing uh, as well, and MRI is uh, an application of that, so I'm, I'm not by any means an MRI expert. Um, so I'm learning this topic as well. So uh, just a brief overview. Um, what made me interested in compressed sensing was uh, the fact that low rank applications are, are very common. Um, so uh, in the keynote, you would have uh, got a whole talk on matrices and sparsity. Um, and so this leads into it very nicely. Uh, so uh, compressed sensing benefits MRI to reduce data acquisition times. So um, uh, if you go into an MRI machine, you spend quite a bit of time there um, to get scanned. And so uh, uh, people are trying to work on this problem to, to make it go faster. And so one of the ways is to, to undersample the data. Um, and uh, because it's sparse, we can do a decent job at uh, reconstructing um, uh, the data and at the same time uh, denoise the image. Um, so yeah, that's what we're interested in. We're interested in uh, the speed, the accuracy of the reconstruction, and uh, robustness uh, if you're going to train machine learning models. Um, so our aim here is uh, identifying uh, fast lossy compression algorithms uh, with minimal uh, artifacts. And um, uh, Julia is a great framework for doing rapid prototyping and experimentation. So 
compressed sensing, what is it? Um, it's a signal processing technique for reconstruction from um, missing data. So um, you, if you have a, a matrix, um, uh, we're interested in underdetermined linear systems, so where we have uh, more um, unknowns than equations. Uh, so what makes sparsity work is uh, that we need to make some assumptions. So we're assuming that the problem that we're dealing with is um, uh, sparse. Uh, so in terms of uh, if you've got a, a matrix, it may look dense, but um, taking linear combinations will eliminate the uh, rows of a matrix. Um, so that's what sparsity can look like. And uh, incoherence, which is basically uh, the features that perform that reconstruction are uncorrelated. Um, so once we've got those two properties, um, that's a good application for using uh, compressed sensing. Uh, various e examples of where this has been applied is uh, matrix completion. So um, works by Jeffrey Hinton um, with the Netflix competition. So uh, rating of movies. Um, if you've got uh, similar people watching uh, the same type of movies, one person hasn't watched other movies of the other person, and uh, you want to see what uh, they may be rating those movies that they may not have watched. Um, Amazon probably does this. Um, yeah, uh, you got a matrix of missing data. Um, compressed sensing could be used there. Uh, single pixel camera is a, another application. So um, obviously your digital cameras, they are all CMOS uh, based uh, sensors and um, you might think, oh, who cares about using compressed sensing, things scale up to more slow and whatnot. But um, when it comes to more niche applications where we are uh, sampling um, uh, beyond the visible um, uh, spectrum, uh, that's where these uh, applications may be um, interesting. Um, and then obviously there's MRI and a lot more. Uh, this field is um, not particularly new. The mathematics has been around for quite some time, but it has been sort of popularized in the mid-2000s by uh, uh, Candice, um, Donahoe, Tao, and uh, others. Um, so hopefully um, you all know a bit of linear algebra here. So um, the SVD is a, a great starting point in terms of um, looking at uh, how we may sample uh, the matrix. Uh, so if we wanted to reconstruct a, a good approximation to A, um, the, the best we can do is uh, doing the singular value decomposition. So um, uh, all these, are, um, A is the matrix, U, sigma's diagonal, V is transpose, they're, they're all matrices. So what we do is, um, uh, we take the largest uh, singular values from uh, sigma, and then um, we take its corresponding columns and from u and multiply that with the, the sigma, and then um, the corresponding rows of um, v transpose. Uh, when we do that, we will get uh, the same dimensions as the matrix A, but it will be a the best possible approximation to that. And um, if you read more about linear algebra, that's uh, sort of proven by um, urquhart young theorem um, that basically that's the best uh, rank K approximation. Um, if you're in machine learning, um, if you've done principal component analysis, uh, if you look under the hood, um, you'll find that uh, its implementation may be based on the, the SVD. So, um, yeah, knowing a bit of linear algebra is good. Um, so MI reconstruction. Uh, general idea is um, if you've got some data set, so uh, I've used the NYU fast MRI data set here. Um, it's uh, read, in, read in as a .h file. file. Um, so it's a basically case-based data. Um, you get real and imaginary parts, so it's, uh, so it's three-dimensional because there are a bunch of slices. So I just take one slice of that uh, case space, um, look at, perform the inverse fast Fourier transform to uh, convert that case space into an image. Then um, what I do is uh, IFFT shift, which uh, takes the, um, 
the, the first quadrant, um, swap it with the, the third quadrant, and then the second quadrant with the fourth quadrant to um, reconstruct the, the image, and then perform compre any of your favorite compressed sensing methods to the noise further. So that's what the original image looks like um, on the, the left there. Um, once you do the IFT, I, IFFT and the shift, um, on the right is the, the case space representation of that image. You can, so if you do a Google, you'll see an image that maybe not looks like that, but um, uh, because the scaling uh, is uh, a bit off, but uh, you can see that uh, we've got a huge void of black space around. So what that's telling you is the, the, the sparsity, the inherent sparsity of this uh, MI application. And a lot of the interesting information is uh, captured in the lower frequencies. So that's towards the, the middle there. Um, so one of the first algorithms we look at is uh, singular value thresholding. Um, and uh, I think this is uh, based off the um, Emmanuel Candice's paper. Uh, so what we do here, um, very similarly um, with the, the SVD, um, but what we do is uh, for each of the singular values, the largest ones, we subtract um, a value lambda, which is arbitrary. And then, so that subscript plus there just means that uh, if we do this multiple times, we'll eventually go negative. And what we do is we take the, the, the maximum of that value. So we don't, we stay positive. Uh, we keep iterating over this uh, um, several times until we, uh, our reconstruction sort of converges. So we, we no longer denoising any further. Uh, so that's what the, um, the image looks like after, um, in this case, a single iteration, uh, cho choosing a lambda of four, and then only takes about a second to run. Um, and note the file size as well as we go through um, these uh, algorithms. So uh, you expect the file size to decrease as we con continue to denoise the image. And on the left there, you can see the exponential drop off in the singular value. So it goes to show that you only need to sample the first K to do a decent reconstruction. Um, if you, yeah. So uh, that, uh, the first thing to do is to, uh, these are hyperparameters, the number of iterations, um, lambdas are hyperparameters, so you'll play around with these until you get an image that you like. Um, if you were a bit impatient and you don't want to iterate uh, numerous times, then set the lambda value uh, a bit bigger. And um, in this case, uh, if it's one, we have to iterate four times to get something of a similar, uh, a similar kind of image. And uh, yeah, again, that, sort of shows that exponential drop off in singular values. Uh, also note the file size too was similar. Um, so let's move on to uh, iteration of this algorithm. Now um, with the SVT, uh, if you denoise too much, you get sort of some blurring in the image. Uh, what we can do here to correct that is uh, uh, the blocked SVT. Um, so what we do is we take the SVT of, a, of a, a sub part of the image, like a patch, and then SVT that across the image and uh, potentially overlapping uh, the patches as we move to the Im over the image. Um, and that's what that formula in, uh, describes there um, as we iterate uh, for each patch. And uh, it's a weighted sum of the, the patches. So um, uh, the more we patch up the, the greater, uh, yeah, we divide by the weight there. And on the right there is just the hyperparameters that you can play around. Um, if uh, what you'll find is uh, some blocky sort of artifacts as a result of the, the block SVT, but um, the, the thing is that if you want to reduce on that, you reduce the, the patch size and then you increase the amount in which you overlap. Uh, so that's what you get. Um, the, the patch sizes there are really uh, fine. Uh, overlapping is really fine as well. 
Um, and there's a, obviously a trade-off with computation as you're doing more SVT sort of calculations, but each of those could be probably done in parallel so to speed things up further. Um, and so uh, finding that balance would give you a, an image like that. Um, and the file size, again, has, uh, is reasonably small. Um, I won't spend too much time on this one, but uh, Julia has uh, other uh, libraries that you can perform signal processing on, on an image. Uh, so here, I, uh, if you know the noise distribution of the MRI machine, if, it's, if you uh, a priori it's a Gaussian or Poison or uh, some other noise distribution, you can try to extract the, the noise out from the image uh, by performing a Wiener deconvolution. Um, you can mix and match these uh, sort of techniques as well. Um, Julia has a, a library that allows you to um, uh, save that image as a JPEG and um, apply compressed sensing on top of that uh, JPEG image to reduce the file size further. Um, moving on to uh, more advanced techniques. So um, uh, this total variation sort of uh, techniques, one of those is uh, anisotropic total variation. Um, there's a paper on that by Goldstein and Osher from UCLA. Uh, the equation is as follows. Um, you take the minimum of uh, uh, the image U, uh, which we're trying to reconstruct, uh, the, the sort of uh, gradient uh, with respect to X on U, um, and then uh, plus the grade again on Y, um, and then we have that uh, um, two norm term on the right, um, which is the uh, mu divided by two, um, and then the difference between the, in, the, the image that we started off with and the image that we're trying to reconstruct. So uh, the, the value mu is again a hyperparameter that encodes how much you care about being too far away from the original image. Um, this is a particularly hard problem to solve because um, we've got some L1 terms. The first two terms are L1. Uh, the, the last term there is an L2 term, which is fine because it's convex, um, uh, differentiable. Um, and uh, what we do to uh, solve this method is um, the spit bregman method. So that's uh, probably falls into the class of augmented Lagrangian methods. Um, it's a sort of a special case of that. And uh, um, when you, whenever you've got L1 terms and L2 terms stuck there like that, which makes it hard to solve, um, there's a whole class of convex optimization algorithms called operating splitting methods you might have heard of, which um, basically sort of uh, solve each of those in tandem. So uh, solve the L1 first using some shrinkage method and then uh, moving to the L2 term, solving that and going back and forth. Um, so that's what the image looks like. Um, the original on the left, um, the denoised image on the right, and only took one second to perform uh, uh, a denoised image, uh, you know, to denoise that image on a single slice. Uh, Obviously, there's some artifacts that result in using uh, anisotropic denoising, um, such as uh, uh, it tries to preserve the, the edges of the, the image, but um, uh, yeah. There's another type of uh, total variation denoising called isotropic. Um, the formula is uh, pretty much identical. The only difference is that we don't have those L1 terms like we did previously. So um, the first term there is, uh, you know, two norm um, with the square root, and we take the sum of that, we put the, the gradients within that square root and sum them up, and then the right-hand side is, again, trying to uh, make sure that we don't go too far from the original image. And again, um, in the paper, you'll find that this is also can be solved with the split Bregman method. Uh, so that's what we get. Um, 
between the two images. I haven't denoised them enough to, to sort of see what the differences look like. Um, but uh, um, yeah. Okay, so some challenges is um, that I've got to work through as I uh, progress my journey in, into this topic. Uh, Hyperparameter selection, um, identification of uh, good metrics, um, uh, for, uh, trying to measure the amount of artifacts in an image um, is a, also an ongoing research topic as well. Um, but what I've uh, done um, was to try to create a, a library uh, that is probably already published, um, micompress.jl. Um, it's in 0 0.0.1, so uh, you know, expect it to be a bit buggy and whatnot, but um, that's the API there. Uh, if you do a simple import and then perform the compression that you want on the image, selecting the specific method and the files that you want to denoise. Um, and also the console output shows you the various metrics. Uh, they were selected based on another paper that I read, um, looking at mean absolute error, mean squared error, um, and probably something more interesting, uh, the SSIM or the structure similarity metric. Um, the variances there are, are, are zero. You might have noticed because I'm only doing it for one image, so uh, that explains that. Um, data flow, um, so that's just pictorically what I described previously about how you take in an image and denoise it. Um, and then there's obviously uh, some feedback loop that goes through the experimentation process of um, selecting your hyperparameters and cross-validating it if you're trying to train a model with this. Um, also another thing is a dashboard um, I've created which allows you to compare and contrast the various um, uh, algorithms that I've implemented um, and also tuning, ability to tune the relevant hyperparameters of that, of that particular method. Um, I've also tried to deploy this onto Amazon to hopefully show other people that may want to work with me on this library. Um, it's uh, dockerized, it's got Julia inside Docker, so it, and the dashboard is implemented with uh, Plotly.js, um, the dash framework. Um, so uh, yeah, that's it's all in there. Um, and I've relied on a lot of project dependencies to make this happen. Um, so HDF5 to read the um, H5 file, um, FFTW to perform a fast Fourier transform, um, uh, Pluto, uh, which you could use uh, notebooks. Uh, so if you stick in your code there. Um, it allows you to rapidly prototype. You just change the line and then it automatically recompiles and it's really fast. So that's one of the reasons I chose Julia because of that rapid sort of prototyping and um, speed that you get. Um, and all the other libraries that allow you to perform image processing um, as well. And we haven't covered, this is only scratching the surface of uh, MRI uh, image processing, it's a, it's a huge topic. Um, we haven't even gone into uh, looking at artifacts and we've just been focusing on how do we reconstruct the, the image, compress it down as much as we can, but it's trying to stay as close to the original as possible. Um, but uh, that's just a survey of techniques that I've found. Um, Autoencoders, if you're into neural networks, that can also be used to model nonlinearities um, in the image. Uh, and flux.js, you probably can whack together uh, uh, an implementation of that. Um, something I tried earlier was matrix completion via nuclear norm minimization, and I tried to shove that, I tried to formulate that as a semi definite program, and then shove that into a, a generic solver that uh, could be used, but then it, it took too long because of the number of constraints that I was giving the 
the solver. So uh, that would number of constraints is bounded by the, the size of the image, each pixel, and it's like, nah, this is not going to work. I'm not going to wait that long. Uh, although it solves quickly, but the time it takes to put the prompt together just took too long, and I say, yeah, um, there must be a operator splitting methods that would just iteratively do this uh, in the most cheapest and fastest way possible. Uh, some, that's a non-exhaustive uh, reference list if you want to learn more about each of the individual methods, uh, more about convex optimization. Um, uh, the examples by Boyd are a good starting point. Um, Van der Berge, uh, lecture slides um, go into the advanced topics of convex optimization. There's a, a big book as well if you just need to get started. Um, on that topic. And, uh, yep, that's about it. Um, leave it for questions. Yeah, so, uh, have, uh, you were showing like metrics uh, like file size, uh, et cetera, uh, for, uh, but especially with the denoising part, uh, have you? Uh, talked with physicians or worked with them yet uh, and kind of asked for their opinions or is that? That's the next step. That's, mm -hmm. I think that's probably, I come to the conference and hopefully meet some people in that field, you know. Um, yeah, so that's the next step. <laughs> I, have, I have a follow up to that. Um, I saw that you, uh, you show between square errors and square errors, but I think there was a version of the the, of the features. But then I'm starting to think that, especially for MRI, there are certain poses and planes where some regions of the picture are more important than others. And like uh, having sharpness at certain points is more impactful and it can be more lossy at other points. So do you think that a way to improve on that is to take that into consideration when you either calculate your errors or when you build your, your conversion techniques? Yeah, so I think the blocked SVT, or you can probably just apply those uh, algorithms to a particular part of the image and do it patch-wise, and then um, uh, probably tune the uh, metrics so, you know, to the, based on what you've described to uh, reflect uh, the that kind of error. Uh, well, your presentation in the title has a lot about compressed sensing and denoising, so I guess there are two parts, at least three parts to a presentation, I guess. But about the compressed sensing part, uh, I work in geophysics, and we also work, I don't particularly, but there's a guy in my group that works with it. And normally compressed sensing is in the sensing part, right? Normally you want to sense the data in a compressed manner, and recover the true data, right? That's the, the whole idea about compressed sensing. But there is a theorem that unless this sensing is random, random, uh, it doesn't reconstruct the real data. Uh, and you, you show a lot of images about how you denoise data, and you show the original image and the denoise image, but how that correlates to compressed sensing in the sensing department? Uh, because I think it's a still open problem today, how do you make uh, sensing, sensing devices they are random. And how does, how is that done in MRI? Because I have no idea. Uh, I don't have any idea too. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, one way is to try to model the, the machine or the, the system, introducing noise um, into the, the image, and then uh, sort of see how you could um, apply uh, the techniques of compressed sensing and, you know, to, ex or denoising techniques to pull out the noise out from the, the image. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So using the... Uh, because when you say compressed sensing techniques, it's kind of an ambiguous thing because um, normally compressed sensing is only for the sensing part. Of course, you can try to see, make simulations and, uh, and try to apply compression techniques like my app. But normally you have some kind of transformation function, you use FFT in your case, yeah. but it can be regular transform, it can be other transforms. Yeah. Any kind of transform that you can 
applied to the theorems of the sense theory. Uh, I think you should write back, I guess. Yeah, these, uh, these total variation things are very interesting. But I have a question about Julia now. <laughs> Uh, you said that you deploy, and this is a very interesting part in the final, in the final phase of the presentation, that you deploy something with Julia in the AWS with Dockerized containers and stuff, right? And I always have problems running Julia on a container. I don't know if everybody has this kind of problem here, if it's not a single thing with me, but uh, normally the problem is that Julia installs everything in the .julia folder, the depot folder, right? And if that folder is not writable, it complains. And normally, it's okay, but I don't know. How did you do it, man? Kind of curious. Um, I think uh, I tried to start with a, a container, and then shove stuff in randomly. <laughs> then, we, you know, it's like doing the thing that you know probably is dodgy, but uh, and it doesn't it didn't work at the end of it. So what I did was just within the Docker file explicitly say these are the dependencies in the uh, project.toml file. And then um, uh, uh, tell uh, Docker to get Julia to um, uh, put in the files that it needs, like the H5 file that it needs to read, um, and uh, that was. And then expose the port um, so that uh, because it's a web application, um, it's, uh, it was deployed as an EC2 container sort of instance. So um, once you've opened the specified that in Docker, uh, that this is the port that you need to uh, um, open. So when it gets deployed, then uh, you can navigate to the page. So I've done this probably 100 times failing to get this deployed. Um, yeah. Go back on the comment about uh, MRI scans. I think the, the challenge you have with MRI images is that they've already been through a huge deloitting pipeline in the manufacturer before you, the image is actually presented to the way you I think what, what's much more interesting is getting hold of the, the raw data, the actual electromagnetic fields, and applying these kind of techniques to that data to see if you can do better than the, the hardware manufacturers. Um, I think if you ask them nicely, you might get access to that data, but they're not, get, they're not always a friend of this. Um, so I looked at the fast MRI data set. I'm not sure whether that's raw data because um, they're all post. Okay. They're not <coughs> totally happy about giving you the, but you might be able to. I wonder if there are any buses that have MRIs. There, there, there probably are. If you took it apart and intercepted the data, you, you could. Uh... Right. Thank you very much, Alex.
Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Um, this is our second talk today on the bio track. Um, we have Edmund Miller here talking about the state of machine learning for biological data. So thank you very much. Let's start. Okay, good morning, everybody. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, I'm also an AF core maintainer, if you're familiar with those pipelines. Um, if not, go check them out. They're great. Uh, lots of great reproducibility being done there. Uh, so I've been machine learning curious since about 2017, um, is what I'd say. And I kind of never really picked it up. I got caught in a lot of the reproducibility of bioinformatics and whatnot, rather than actually applying machine learning, because I also think that there's lots of issues with machine learning and reproducibility. Um, I also never took linear algebra. That's a kind of inhibiting factor as well. Uh, so I had some questions uh, to answer about this and kind of figure out about the various loading of biological data and how that would look in Julia um, compared to some Python projects. Um, and then kind of like what are all the trade-offs of, of these various packages that are out there and how can we use them in biological data. So, and I also have a personal interest in genomics as well. So, this talk. We have, I have a friend on the Do Me Max channel um, named Michael, and uh, he used to have this on his GitHub pr uh, profile of be the PR you want to see in the repo. So I'm going to do the talk that I wanted to see at JuliaCon. So kind of the goal of most biologists um, is that we're not trying to create novel machine learning models. Uh, some people may try to, but I'm not. I'm just trying to apply these in novel ways to biological systems and biological data, and then make biological inferences using the, those machine learning models. So I kind of had an old overview and kind of an outline that I was going to go through, of kind of calling Python in R packages, uh, what are these different ML packages, and then kind of like loading the biological data formats, et cetera, and some pretty basic toy examples of that. And then I had a thought. What if I reproduce some analyses? and then recount what I learned along the way. So what I did was a paper that I was on recently uh, called MLF Core, spun out from some people in NF Core, where we tried to build a reproducible set of tools for machine learning um, as well, and specifically in biological sciences. And so it kind of goes through various things, and we have models that, that we support, templating uh, so that you can keep it up to date with the latest best practices without doing a ton of extra work. Um, visualizations, it hooks into MLflow as well. Um, 
if you're interested in that, we can always talk about that. It hasn't caught on yet because I don't. They're not very passionate about the uh, reproducibility of machine learning. But basically, the entire premise is then using deterministic models rather than non-deterministic models. So I was not responsible for the machine learning aspect of this. I wrote the Python package um, and do, did all the templating and whatnot because I was familiar with that from NF Core. So kind of the whole premise of MLF Core was to take MLflow, build it with read, build docs with read the docs, support Conda and Docker um, on those, and create some various tooling. So then that runs in all these different container aspects on the cloud, on HPC, um, and then all of your runs are reproducible across those so other people can go out and reproduce your research eventually. And so to just get started with that, it was just very simple to do pip install MLF, MLF core and MLF core help would then list out the entirety of the tooling. You can list out the various templates like TensorFlow and PyTorch and uh, XDBoost. Um, and then lastly, you can just create those pipelines from that. So why do we care about reproducibility in science so much? Um, as compared to like selling ads or chatbots, which can be you know variable and there can be some like loss in that, we have lives at stake with these of people getting diagnoses and then scientists who are trying to reproduce this research later down the line. So the first example that we used was called LCEP. And so kind of what it was trying to do was it was trying to classify cancerous liver samples from gene expression data. Um, that's just RNA-seq data for anyone that's familiar with that. Um, it's just basically where you take a bunch of cells and then you sequence the RNA from those cells and then you count them up and then you do some statistical modeling around that. So it was a nice little warm up. Um, the purpose is to kind of demonstrate the creating of a Python package using MLF core um, in the paper and then package and then using that package in a Nextflow pipeline. Uh, there's a link to the repo as well and I'll have a link to the slides at the end. So. Um, what it kind of ended up looking like in Python was this data loading section of this. And basically you can see that there's a lot of like conversion to NumPy arrays and then converting from NumPy arrays to XGBoost uh, data matrices as well. And then also going down and then loading this data set and passing all of those out. Um, and then we'll come back to the whole parsing of the TPM table as well and that's a whole nightmare. Um, whereas in Julia, it was very simple of I just fed it some URLs uh, loaded into a CSV and into a data frame. Um, you also don't have to dance around with, uh, I keep switching between XGBoost and XDBoost. So um, the, the data matrices are just automatically loaded from a data frame package as well, and then the wrapper just handles that for you. So you don't have to dance around with NumPy arrays and learn all these various libraries. So this is kind of what the data looks like when it's loaded up. So you have a gene ID over there on the left. The gene name was missing from the data set. And then you have these sample names over here in these columns. And the zeros are for normal data sets. And the ones are for cancerous data sets. And so then this is part of the MLF core example that we had with the Python. And to be fair, pandas probably could have been used here. But it created this entire like elaborate way of parsing this TSV and splitting off the info and all these various things that, were, that was difficult to use. Um, and then basically just zipping it up and then sending it back out to do this. But basically so that it could be loaded into a NumPy array was what the purpose of this was so that it could be sped up. Whereas with Julia, it was very simple, um, as you saw before. And then we can just go into cleaning this data instead where we can find all the zeros, for example, and then we can drop the gene name column. Um, and then we can flip the data frame around using some some of the uh, functions, and then we can just find which ones are cancerous and which ones are normal and create some labels for this training set. So onto the training um, of this. There's not much difference between Julia and Python here. Um, basically, again, you can see the num NumPy round, whereas you can just use like just plain Julia all the way through, um, which is really nice to just be able to follow that in that sense. And I think that kind of touches on the purpose of this and the difficulty with biologists who may not have a background in programming and may get lost in some of these extra things when applying these machine learning um, libraries. And then when those libraries are then applied, the difficulties with the code reading and other people following along what was, what was happening. So I also wanted to throw some GPUs at it as well. Uh, I used a Julia notebook template um, to use in CoLab as well for free GPUs, if anyone's interested in that. 
Um, basically, again, very simple. It just uses its GPU, and then it hooks up to CUDA. Uh, .jl, and that just automatically loads the CUDA duplicate for you. So it's just great. Um, it's really simple to use as compared to all of the different pain points that you'd have with Python and whatnot. So onto the single cell autoencoder. Um, so this is a very common data set. It's 3,000 peripheral blood mononuclear cells um, is what it is. And it's from Genex Genomics. So single cell RNA sequencing, if you're not familiar with, is RNA sequencing. But then we take each individual cell, give it a barcode, and then we sequence it, and then down the line. So you can actually get various data, various cell types in, in between that data set, rather than this kind of homogenous RNA sample from this. Um, so I had an issue with this one, though. Instead of giving a nice TSV, they started with an H5AD uh, data set, which is part of ScanPy. Um, and so they also use ScanPy then to load and clean the data, which is a Python package. So I started trying to reproduce the like exact replicate of the ScanPy functionality in Julia. Um, they actually happen to have a, have a Julia package that they've been working on uh, in single cellverse, which is the ScanPy authors. Um, so essentially, the package here uh, should lo just load up this. Uh, H5AD file. However, it didn't uh, through an error because it was out of date for whatever reason with the Julia version that I was using. Um, so I got to experience an interesting piece of Julia is that you can just clone a repo there with dev um, and you can just use develop and dash dash local and then you can load up this package. Of course. Um, good. So anyways, then that repo is then cloned at dev um, slash move on. Um, and then it's also added to the project.toml for tracking and reproducibility of that, which is also great. And then you can start to just use your entire fork and push that code up and then make a quick PR whenever you finish it um, and figure out what the bug was. So to be fair, you can also do this in Python with pip-e, but um, in here it's Julie all the way down was the difference. So I could actually hop into the code, mess around with it, and figure it out versus like jumping into some weird C functions and various bindings. So I think that that's really powerful as well. Um, when you start to hit errors in the stack in these like packages that no one else is using, for example. So um, I, that's above my pay grade to fix that, however. So I then went back and revisited um, just actually loading a Python package and with um, this in Python call. So there's then the using Conda uh, package, um, Julia package. And so then all you need to do is just add the conda channel, which is very simple, and then uh, conda add scanpy. And what I love is the toml that it spits out as well, so then it's just fully reproducible from the get-go. Just automatically gets generated in your environment uh, from that. If you haven't s seen that, take a look at it as well, compared to some bioinformatics code that I've come across. So I did kind of stumble on that as well. I got confused between whether Python and, and PyCall were the same package, which is a common Thing that new that new people stumble upon, so I just wanted to include that in the talk as well. Um, so Python call doesn't have as much legacy to support in their section is on this, whereas PyCall doesn't reference Python call, which I think is part of the issue. Um, so Python call support only has to support Julia 1.6 and Python 3.7, so it doesn't have to do as much work as the others. And then there, whereas PyCall is trying to support 0.7 and 2.7 and onwards, so that's that's why they can do more in Python call and use things like conda package. Um, and then also using that by default just makes it sane for people to use. So the other added trade-off is that you can use them both at the same time for any reason that you might need that as well. So you're not really having to make a trade-off and make a decision on that. So what this ends up looking like, which I thought was really cool, is you just load this in, you do pi import, um, scan pi, and then I, could, I just took the old preprocessing uh, function and just swapped it in, and it just works, which I think is really powerful, considering all these other libraries that are already pre-written. So this is just going through, normalizing and scaling the data, 
and then picking out some of the very highly variable genes on those, scaling, and then setting it to that. And so what the old function used to do is it would do some fancy TensorFlow loading and, and prepare for the model, um, whereas in Julia, you can just use a natural array um, and just make it a float 32. And then the you'll notice down there that little the return of like returning x and then x because what we're trying to do in this model is go from like plane out to or like the input to the to the direct output as well um, and we'll talk about that in a moment with the model so this was the original code was this whole tensor slices and then I was trying to dive in and figure out what this is doing exactly whereas and then I realized oh I can just return it in Julia you don't have to learn what that means specifically in all this various slicing. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. So I ran into a slight issue where Conda doesn't work well on NixOS. Uh, so I was running this on our school cluster instead. Uh, so I just kind of exported the X matrix so I could work faster rather than rerunning that beginning of the, of the analysis every time. Uh, and so then I, of course, had to give a shout out to Data Toolkit, and we'll talk about that for a moment. So what this package is doing is creating an entire um, data catalog in your repo for your data. Um, so essentially you just call, you add the package to your repo there. Um, you can call curly braces and that switches over to a data REPL. You can then init your data.toml and then you can add a data set. So I just added that, threw it up on Hugging Face um, as somewhere to just toss a, a file and, and toss the matrix up there. So what would actually be better practice is to use the built-in Julia loader for, for data toolkit as well, and then I could have the entire pre-processing script, then have this second script of like, okay, now I have a matrix here, and then loading from there. But this was just to get it done on that. So what this ends up spinning out is this nice toml here where you have this description of pre-processed uh, PMBC 3K single cell data set. Um, on that, and then you can see the driver where it's pulling from the web and the URL, and then the loader, which in this case is just the delimiter um, library, and then it's just saying that that's just a tab, and then what data type to use for that. Um, and so this is really powerful. You can use this with CSVs, images, all kinds of stuff, um, and what ends up happening in your code, rather than all that extra loading, is you just get this, and you just can load your data set with the D um, macro on that and just specify your data set. And so that's really powerful to be able to hand it to another collaborator. I don't know how often y'all have had this, but also often people have given me analyses and then it's like, okay, where'd you get the data from? And they're like, oh, well, I have it locally here, but they can't tell you how they found it on the internet. So if you're interested in that, there's a talk on Friday um, with Timothy. That's the information for it on the entirety of Data Toolkit. We'll go very into the weeds on it, I promise. So uh, I got a little bit into Flux as well, um, which is important. It is very elegant. I wanted to emphasize that. I understand why they italicize that afterwards. Um, it just makes a lot more sense than other machine learning libraries, I think. Um, so back to the model of single cell autoencoder. So all that we were trying to do here, and this is very common to do in single cell analyses, is we're just trying to go from input to output the exact same. And what this was trying to demonstrate in the paper is that using these non-deterministic operations, you can end up with not going one-to-one -one on these, and so that creates a lot of noise in that. Um, and so basically, all of these like various uses of denoising the single cell data and predicting perturbation responses is kind of, is it really happening, or is it just part of the randomness of the model? So uh, this was just the, uh, the flux loader. Um, so the TensorFlow aspect had a lot of chaining and, and whatnot, whereas this is very simple just to load, the, load both of those data sets, which is the, um, the actual training data and the labels there, and then you can just throw in the batch size, and of course there's more params that you can toss in there as well. And then I pulled this from a blog post on autoencoders on this, um, so you can just set the device that it's gonna be run on, uh, which is the CPU in this case, um, because it's a relatively small model. And then you can see the various layer sizes of those and specifying those and the batch size for that. And so then this is just the model. Um, and I just thought that it was very elegant and made a lot of sense from someone who's not an expert in this. 
So this is just taking the size of the data frame, um, D, up there, and then you're taking the layer one from our previous variables here, in case anyone's forgotten that. And then we're just kind of we're building the model and linking it together of L1 to L2, L2 to L3, and then so forth, and then back out. And then you just have this chaining function down here at the, at the end, and it just loads up by that device. So I just thought this was really easy to understand as a biologist versus all, like you understand the concept and what the model looks like, but then the building of it gets hairy when you start to use these other um, machine learning models. And so then the training of this, um, so this is just, this is the kind of the for loop way of doing it in, in Flux as well by the default. Um, and you can see that we've just used the, the same loss function as the previous one. It was all there, um, everything that I needed. And then you can see that we just update the model at the very end after we, we run through and do these gradient responses of that. So this is the fancy uh, Flux train as well. Um, you can also give it a, a with progress to get a nice taskbar as well on that. And so then we have, a, you just feed in the model, the training set, and then it just runs this loss function every single time is what it's doing uh, under the hood. And it's much simpler and, and more condensed to run it that way as well. But they start you out with both in the tutorial. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the liver seg CT segmentation aspect of this. Um, so the liver tumor segmentation of the computed tomography scans, so just basically it took CT scans. Uh, this is an open data set that's out there as well that you can go and download um, using a UNET model. And then the data in this challenge uh, contains these CT scans and then the contrast is for various liver lesion, lesions. So you can see the liver class over there and then the tumor class on those and then you can, you can overlap them is what ends up happening. So then the model in this one is a 3D UNET architecture. Um, and so I, I'm going to be honest, I don't understand how it works, but this is the model that people use for a 3D unit um, of that. And so from that, then we need to load the data, which is the NII files. Um, and of course, there's a Julia package already for that. It's also been, it's, it was nine years old, which I was kind of surprised by. Um, on those, and then the unit for that um, is also just already a package as well that's written in Flux, and so then it just has the various convolutions going down and then back up as well um, on those. I sadly had to cut going through this whole one for time based on those um, of not being able to reproduce the entirety of this one. So, in conclusion, uh, some things that we touched on. The simplicity of data loading, uh, I think that that's crucial the various hacking of dependencies live when you run into a package that's no longer maintained or just out of date. Um, we also talked about calling Python packages from Julia. Um, and then we also talked about data toolkit a little bit and how we can have more reproducible analyses with that. And then we also talked about Flux for a bit. And then also we talked about how there were plenty of packages that are already out there ready for biology and Julia on that. So um, some things I didn't get answers to that kind of my idea of reproducing the ML core that I got distracted from is I'd also like to understand how to load up various BAMs like deep variant and what does that kind of look like on those. So what deep variant does is it takes its alignment from a BAM um, or and a faster reference, creates these various examples, and then it creates a convolutional neural net and calls these using that um, that pile up down there at the bottom and basically running through those. So that's something to stay tuned for that you'll, you'll see in a follow-up of this. And then it spits out various variant calls from that. And then I also kind of want to see what Celine would look like as well um, in, from the function lab. And so that's just a deep learning library as well for um, finding various motifs in genetic analyses. And then one thing that I also found missing as well in some of the documentation was how do you have more determinism in these, we talked about all these deterministic models, um, and I think that's going to be Lux.jl. If anyone has any ideas, feel free to reach out on that. And so, links to slides and links to my link tree. Any questions? Um, I have a strong sense that when we're talking about biological problems, interpretation of machine learning arises as a very important thing because ultimately, we do want to be informed about where the species or the genes or the molecule that actually
many contributors that are not aware of modeling, so that they can become like biomarkers or potentially like initial tests for causal modeling and other things. So I was wondering if you could, if you can, and if you would comment a little bit on the current state for machine learning interpretation in Julia. For machine learning interpretation. Because I, I know that like for three models, we have her natural importance measures, for like general linear models, we have sizes and two values. We have shape layer values, which are agnostic, but like from your entire experience, all, all but through all the story that you told, mm -hmm. like what, what have you learned about interpreting and acquiring biological insight of all the stuff that you're modeling? Mm. So I think that's kind of an issue with the the various examples. Like this one might be more biological modeling, whereas the first model is kind of binary of like cancerous, not cancerous. So you're you're not really doing much interpretation there. You're just kind of like, is it cancerous or not? Um, and then in the single cell autoencoder, you're just looking for can we go from these this input of this tensor to that tensor, essentially on that. Um, in a reproducible way. So this is more of the modeling that I think that you're looking at and then the kind of inference from that. Is that am I following your question? Um, yeah, perhaps. But like, I, I disagree that we just want good benchmarks. I think that we like, for, for example, in this problem, we want to be able to look at the, the, the 3D reconstruction of a liver image and say, well, those regions are important, so maybe our MRI technicians have to take good care of them, our image compression techniques have to lose less information on those regions. And, and this is where, like for example, uh, QNETs are very good at telling us for each channel what are the most important parts of the image, for example. And this is, for, for biologists, I want to believe, and this is for the personal opinion, but I want to believe that knowing those things is as important as have natural predictions. So that's why I'm asking you, like, what do you understand is the current state of interpreting and assigning importance to things we know biologically towards the predictions? I don't know, it sounds like you kind of an answer to that. But <laughs> you have an idea. Actually, uh, like, as I said, aside from Shapley values, are agnostic. I, I don't, and that's why I'm asking that. Because I'm, I'm really at a loss right now. I, if anyone has a, uh, has a right. Well, I just, like, follow up is the, like, for the single cell data, like, just compressing and uncompressing single cell data, like, by itself is not valuable, right? What we want to know is how can we understand what that single cell data tells us about the underlying biological phenomena. And mm -hmm. Having a compressed version, we do something with that that we can't do with the giant single cell data that that we fed in, right? Like compression and decompression on its own is not not super useful unless we're using the compressed data in a novel way, right? And then applying that data set to something, right. right? So that's kind of more downstream of like various other libraries and making those inferences from that. And I believe there is a talk on single cell analysis in Julia later this week as well. It'll probably be in, yeah, of, of interest in that case. So that's kind of, yeah, exactly. That would kind of be where it is lacking in that sense. But it's also kind of a discoverability issue with BioJulia that I've found as well. So. Uh, I suppose you use Nixos, right? You mentioned that Conda doesn't work on Nixos. Uh, well, and I agree, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> But I think there is a way to be, no, I think not, but there is certainly a way to build a, a FHS, FH, a FHS environment, development environment. In that way, you can use binaries that are not made for so that's. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can do the whole Mamba, micro Mamba thing in, yeah, in the show. Yeah, but it's a mess. I agree. Exactly. But it was. Exactly. Yeah, but, yeah. And, but yeah. But I see that your presentation, you branch off to, to talk about a lot of stuff, and in the end you talk about biology specifically, but uh, now that you come from Python, and you're introducing yourself to Julia, <coughs> what do you see are the main differences in your usage, not necessarily performance and stuff, 
by usage about TensorFlow and Flux because I see that you try to transition from one to the other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is your experience so far? Exactly, that's a great question. I think that was kind of touching upon the overall theme of I kind of wanted to show it's really simple in that sense and it really makes a lot of sense. And I think that that's the valuable part of Julia as compared to other programming languages is the scientist's time is the most valuable aspect of that, not really even talking about how fast and compute those are. It's about understanding the concept and then being able to be sure of your computation, not like, well, like having this comment of like, I don't know how this works, but it does, you know? You see a lot of those. Right. Thank you very much. No, I was gonna walk over there. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. They also have Interesting. 
interesting is that test one two test one two one two Let's see if that cuts out at all test one two one two one two one two
Test one, two. One, two. One, two. So are you here just because like you're like what are people doing with yeah. biology and Julia? Yes. Yeah. 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 Nice reason to come to Julia for I think because you get to sample a lot of like science and engineering. Yeah. But like, the people who are not biology by background, what what do you have now? Well, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been involved with Julia for a long time and doing a lot of stuff and so yeah, I'm just generally curious about what people what applications people are doing, different techniques, and packages. Uh, I'm Jacob Quinn, by the way, if anyone has I'm Actually, uh, I'm going to ask quickly. So, uh, th there will not be a first talk, but uh, Daniel Poole, uh, you can come and prepare a pair. And I also would want to know, uh, when I'm the first speaker, uh, uh, what do you have? Aditi is here. Because if Adit is not here, not showing up, uh, yeah, it will be useful to know how. <laughs> Worst case, you might get another question. We have to squeeze it. But yeah, start setting up this one. This is it, testing. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Daniel Kuhn, uh, who's going to talk to us about biomarkey. 
Uh, I'm quite excited about this one because I think Mac is like the plotting package I've heard about all of the time. You do this cool of stuff, but I never really like diving into it. So I'm really excited to see what you can do with this. Uh, Daniel, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Dan. Um, I'm going to talk about Biomaki, which is a package for plotting things like protein structures and multiple sequence alignments. But uh, I've been working on this package for a long time, but have made a lot of progress recently. Um, and I'm about to tag a new release uh, that includes a lot of new features that could be helpful for working with protein data. Um, in the future, the plotting may be extended to things like structural RNA and DNA sequences. So why Maki or Machia or Machia? I just say Maki and nobody stopped me. Um, Maki is a Julia native plotting and interface framework that makes it easy for users to construct not just plots, but uh, machinery for displaying and interacting with data. It utilizes observables, which are variables that other variables can listen and react to. So this enables explicit synchronization and event triggering, which is really the heart of user interface. Maki types are also easy to uh, look inside and investigate. One thing that I use all the time is this handy um, uh, type of field names pipeline to see what the types are made of. And I just sort of go recursively through things um, and can get a good idea of what things uh, are laid out like. Um, also, there are multiple backends. GLMaki has by far the most work done. Um, GLMaki opens in a separate window for the display. There's some support for others, but that's expected to grow over time uh, as future work. So Biomaki exists for several purposes, and here they are uh, roughly in order of importance. The main purpose is, for, is to provide plotting functions for types in existing BioJulia packages. The second is to provide a helpful interface for general data analysis and um, working in BioJulia. I think the bio community is kind of small right now, but maybe it'll be easier uh, for newcomers if there's some sort of graphical front end. Another reason are tools that can make selections and generate new data sets. Uh, sometimes being able to select things um, and make judgments based on visual representations is the right way to go. Um, Finally, connecting other languages through a common interface can make some of the most powerful software by taking advantage of their different strengths. So far, there are two packages that I focused on, um, MITOS and BioStructures. Obviously, BioStructures is about protein structures, but MITOS uh, has several modules for structures and multiple sequence alignments and for gathering other sort sources of information. Uh, Protosign is a very impressive package for molecular modeling, but it's hard to use and isn't in the Julia registry. I've done some work on it, and I think there's a lot of potential. Um, up here is uh, an ordered dictionary. This is what the plot data looks like. You can plot the objects directly, or you can use the plot plotting data function to get this dictionary of observables that you then plot so that you have them at, uh, at your disposal to uh, easily manipulate. This first little demo shows information about a protein. We have a structure, but there are uh, also functions to get basically all of the data for the protein using its accession ID and the Unipro database. It includes tons of information about things like significant positions in the structure and sequence and a list of over 2,000 other reference IDs from other databases. At the bottom, there is a text box where you can prompt GPT for a description of the protein um, or whatever, 
using OpenAI.jl and an API key. One of the bigger recent developments are selections, which can be done using the mouse or by modifying the selected observable in the plot data. It doesn't seem like much, but the selections can communicate with other plots, like the multiple, se multiple sequence alignment here. Uh, when you click on a structure, you select a residue. Soon there will be modifiers, like you can hold down uh, control to make multiple selections or alt to select particular atoms. There are informative tool tips, but if they get in the way, they can be easily disabled. Uh, Biomaki can also be used for viewing and creating uh, structure-related point clouds and meshes. This animation on the right is of normal modes from a dynamics model called the anisotropic ne network model, and they can be combined with different phases and extrapolations. The wireframe or mesh uh, is an alpha shape for a protein structure based on atomic coordinates. So alpha shapes are exclusionary uh, and based on the radius alpha. Um, on the left is another example of an alpha shape, but the, in this example there are two radii. The other radius is of atomic spheres originating at the atomic coordinates. So you can make large spheres and then decompose them into points to create a larger and denser points, point cloud from which the surface is computed. For one uh, widely used piece of software called FPocket uh, that gives features based on uh, structure, almost all of them are based on alpha shape geometry. And if you want to use another algorithm to get a mesh, there are other options like Flux3D, um, which is a machine learning package for dealing with point clouds and meshes. There are a few more plotting functions based uh, besides protein structures and multiple sequence alignments. On the right here, you can see a plot of a short protein sequence using molecular graph, where the sequence is converted into a SMILES chemical representation and then plotted using Chiromaki, which is the two-dimensional or uh, canvas display, and it shows accurate stereochemistry and atomic numbering. Heat maps can be made from distance and contact maps, from biostructures or mitos, and the data inspector tool tips are enabled for those as well. So we have structure plotting for multiple bio packages and multiple sequence alignments, selections as well as tool tips are enabled and methods for av are available for creating new data. Future work will in include extending support to other backends, uh, adding more examples and demos and improving the documentation. And based on some of the other talks, there's some exciting work going on in BioJulia with machine learning. So maybe this front end could have some effect there. Contributions and collaborations are very welcome, like uh, new demos and fixing spelling mistakes. Uh, right now, I think user testing and feedback is the most useful thing once I get that new uh, version tagged and out there. I'm pretty much always on Slack, and I pay attention to GitHub and feel free to contact me about literally anything. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for that, Dan. Uh, do I have any questions? Uh, How's your experience been uh, developing with Maki? Uh, plotting has been kind of a bit of a sore spot for Julia, so I'm just kind of curious, you know, you built the whole package on top of it. Like right now, my workflows use like PyPlot and set and some stability. You said something about stability? Sorry, I missed a few of those. Oh, I, just mean, I just mean to say that like, I don't have the same kind of problems. Like, you know, everything is much more fleshed out, there's more documentation. There's just more, you know, just an older package. Uh, so I was just curious, like, how your experiences with Maki? Because uh, I, I know some people who work with plots.jl, so we're just considering switching. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, so I think the main difference is the observable structure and also uh, how the figures are constructed, too. Um, like I showed earlier, there were those uh, recursive sort of fields you can go into. It's really easy to see what they're made up of. And um, once you get the hang of the observables and the event triggering, um, it really becomes a, 
a greater experience than just plotting. So. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I would also say <laughs> we uh, with Maki need uh, user testing and feedback too. So <laughs> I just uh, wanted to ask, like, if you from the top of your head have like one big thing that you would like to be improved, like from your experience, because you seem to have now quite extensive experience. So um, anything like your biggest pain point, maybe? Uh, I, uh, not everything works with WebGL Maki yet. Um, like directly, you can, I can display stuff, but the interaction doesn't work yet. So I think expanding into those other backends. Um, RPR Maki looks really spectacular in terms of graphics, so I'm excited about that well, with ray tracing. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, expanding into those backends and getting support for those. Uh, I just want to check, uh, Aditi, Aditi is still not here. Okay. Uh, if that's the case, like, uh, uh, if you don't mind, we could have some more questions. Uh, okay. Sure. Think. Probably going to have another 10 minutes until next talk in this case. What sequences uh, by row? Uh, the amino acid coloration, can you describe it, how you got that working? Um, specifically, what working? The uh, When you select it and then it makes the vertical line. Oh, yeah, so that um, wasn't trivial, but I will put the example up. Um, so that's also an observables thing. Like um, I had a problem with uh, uh, things updating at the same time or something like that. So there was like a, I was getting notification errors uh, because th things were updating too quickly. So I had to modify it a little bit for that. Um, but once I had things uh, sort of triggering in a sequence rather than at the same time, uh, it started working really well. Yeah. Hi, uh, so I've used some stuff myself, and I'm wondering if you've run into one of the headaches that I've experienced, which is that when errors happen in the course of updating the observable, just tracking down where it came from and what happened seems to be incredibly difficult. Uh, I wonder if this is something that you've experienced as well. Um, yeah, so I guess that comes with um, just experience using it and, and, and typical methods like putting print statements everywhere. Uh, but um, error messages can give a good origin sometimes. Not with observables. Yeah. Um, so I guess I usually look at the um, event triggering uh, as it starts and, and progresses, and then I like disable things and see if it changes, sort of, sort of disable this and that and see if the error message changes. So if you don't know what the error message is, you just change things until it's different. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I can maybe add something to that. What sometimes helps me is uh, actually not using the anonymous functions with lift, right? Like lift, uh, observable A, B, C, do something, because um, then it makes it harder to see in the stack trace what's what, because everything's just called var something. <laughs> yeah. So if you make named functions, then at least you can see what was called where, and that makes it much easier to follow the stack. But I guess. I also just developed the skill to ignore all the observables <laughs> stuff, which is not great, admittedly. Maybe there can be some, uh, I don't know, way of rewriting the, or filtering the stack trace to, to remove all this observable stuff that is extraneous. Okay, it's sort of a kind of hope nobody else minds. Um, but um, I think the experience I had at least with observables, what I'm really missing is just something to go, when an observable is defined, actually having more information about that observable that could be then uh, brought up in a stack trace um, because yes, it was just like observables. I think themselves, errors can't, which is sort of generated functions, um, which just have var something, th those sorts of names, which tell you absolutely nothing about what they're doing or where they ca came from. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if they're able to capture more in contextual information uh, and actually present that as well, 
I thought that could make it somewhat less painful. That's a good idea. idea. Improving the error messages somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because I know like, if you had like an observable macro, then you'd be able to use the like line and module um, variables to actually capture some information about where that observable is defined in the file. Um, but I guess when it's just a function, then it's a bit harder. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> that's, a, that's definitely a thing to, to improve in the future. Yeah, for sure. Inspiration story. It uh, it just didn't exist like a couple of years ago, and so I was like, I'll make it. I don't I don't know. I'll make it, and so that's how it started, pretty much, because um, I'm into like biochemistry, um, and so I wanted to see protein structures and work with them, and so that's how I sort of got started, and then I learned the uh, BioJulia packages. Um, and which ones uh, were best for utilizing protein data. Um, and so I guess I started with the ones that were the most solid, which were biostructures and mitos at the time. Um, and they're still pretty solid. Um, Protosign, I, I think, has a lot of potential. Um, but it's not currently registered, and uh, I can't get it to... Um, compile in Biomaki, so it's like a separate file, you have to do a workaround. Um, but uh, plotting structures works, and uh, I think pretty soon you'll be able to manipulate it, because it's like for uh, molecular modeling and engineering and stuff like that, so uh, that could be really cool. You notice any deficiencies with any biodiversity packages that are currently present that you wish could be improved in the future? Um, I don't know. That's a difficult. Uh, well, I haven't really explored explored sequences that much. Um, I guess I didn't. Uh, there's a lot to do with structures um, in a visual way. Uh, and like with interaction, so um, I guess sequences is something that um, I had trouble getting into. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think we have gotten quite a lot more than the four and four percent up. So we we'll thank that, Daniel. Currently, just outside polishing off slides. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can flag him down on my way to the Yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah. Could send someone to uh, collect Edmund. <laughs> that would be useful. Otherwise, we're going to have another 40 minutes yeah. for silence. Yeah, I'll ask you right there. Excellent, excellent. I might go back before you. I might go from something. Okay. 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 
Okay, uh, welcome to our um, second slash fourth, depending on how you count, talk. Uh, I'm very happy to present Edmund Miller, who's going to talk about uh, genomic analysis in Julia. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, I'm back. Sorry that <laughs> there's no, uh, no one in between. Um, so, I apologize if you, if you heard the other talk. There may be a little bit of overlap in these, but uh, I thought they were both important and I wanted them to be fully encapsulated versus like you need to watch part one and then see part two. So, uh, let's talk about unlocking the power of genomic analysis in Julia. So, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, I'm also an NF Core maintainer uh, as well. Uh, if you haven't checked out NF Core, do so. Uh, the reproducible bioinformatics pipelines for secondary analysis. This talk is going to focus more on tertiary analysis, which is kind of the downstream of the secondary, which would be kind of more the data cleaning, aligning of reads, et cetera, uh, for anyone not familiar with that. So uh, first, I kind of wanted to frame this whole concept of like, why should biologists working in genomics be interested in Julia? Um, and I thought that the Why We Create Julia blog post was a great reason for that um, and really sells the point to a lot of these biologists because they've all kind of worked in these various languages at some point probably of like, you know, they've used R and it's just as easy for statistics. Uh, MATLAB, Python, Perl was um, during the... Yeah, <laughs> that, you know. So they've all used these shell, maybe if you have UC, for example, or like in some of the more finer tools, you know, that are, that are trying to have some more speed. So just a ton of different languages going on here is really kind of what the issue is. Um, and then there's also a issue with reproducibility, I feel, in genomics, um, and that's kind of my shtick. Um, but I feel that Julia really tackles a lot of those issues with reproducibility in data analysis um, in a lot of elegant ways. Um, so why should the Julius enthusiast that wandered into this talk care about genomics? Um, so there's an interest in genomics in keeping the cost low through more efficient computation as well versus we don't care about if the results are coming, in, in some cases, we do care about how quickly the results are coming back, but we don't care about if the results are coming back as fast as possible if we're going to save tenfold on the computation, for example, uh, which is an interesting problem as compared to like financial data um, or like stock trading. So right now the cost of a whole genome uh, sequencing is a hundred to a thousand dollars, depending on who you ask. Um, the cost of the computational analysis, on the other hand, is about twenty-five dollars. So, as you can see, when we're talking about thousand, eh, twenty-five dollars is nothing. When we're talking about a hundred, okay, that's a fourth of the price. Um, and then this is just a nice graph that the uh, NIH likes to put out about how the cost of the human genome sequencing and how it's like beyond Moore's law as well. And so down there, that's 2022, where we're hitting a, like below 1,000 there. And it's kind of a race to the bottom as Illumina lost their recent um, patent on um, the sequencing technology. So there's been a bunch of startups that popped up. So a uh, quick overview of this. So we're going to talk about kind of the Julia features for analysis that I think are important and how they're helping with reproducibility on those. We'll talk about the ecosystem of Julia um, and kind of compare it to like R and Python and all the various packages that you may want. And then we'll talk about Julia and workflows for a little bit as well. And then a little example analysis at the end. So these features for analysis. Um, first and foremost, I really love Julia up um, and the concept of that. I think that a lot of languages get this wrong in the way that they install this and then helping also to the user to then stay up to date with these various release channels as well, of whether you want to use stable or LTS or, you know, your collaborators using some weird package because that's what's on their HPC. Um, Julia up just kind of fixes that. I think it follows the model of Rust up, and I think that those are great. Um, and again, just such a quick way for people to get started. Of course, there's also a Windows install as well, as if you're interested in that. Um, but that should work on Mac or Linux. And then let's talk about pkg.jl um, and how that kind of affects the various package management in bioinformatics. So as you can see, this is the example from the tutorial of we're just installing an example package. You can pull up the REPL, add this example. Similarly to how in R, you just kind of ad hocly install things at times. 
um, from the REPL with library and uh, bioconductor, which is what a lot of people like to do. But the problem is, is that that never gets written down. And then you never know what packages, where they came from, what examples they are. Whereas in Julia, when you're installing this interactively, like a lot of computational biologists like to do, it just writes it down for you as you're working. And then you have that package kept, which I think is really key. And it's probably taken for granted a lot in the community here. Um, so then you can also activate these environments, which are also important um, and to, in the maintenance of that. And then you can just add these packages, same thing, except the difference is, is that now it's also installed into the project.toml and written down um, comparatively. And then the interesting point down there at the bottom left-hand corner is the um, up caret, saying that that could be upgraded, but it's being held back by various things as well um, on those. And then, of course, you can also hack on projects locally um, with just the develop dash dash local. Um, so if you have something that's broken, you can quickly work on it versus, you know, other languages where it may be difficult to go and find that, work on it, where do you get the PR submitted, et cetera. Um, there's a couple other niceties as well. There's PKG templates um, for easy package creation if you want to write something as well. There's the Julia REPL mastery workshop of we could go on about how the REPL's great and you should be doing REPL-driven development um, and talk about closure and all that. And then there's also VS Code with, with the batteries already included environment um, as compared to some other environments on those. And you can use that in an interactive way similar to you know, what people might be familiar with with RStudio, for example. Um, and then we can talk about data toolkit for a moment as well. Um, this is a big issue that I find in a lot of computational biology is where did the data go and where did it come from? Um, so this is a recent analysis that I did on some TCGA uh, head and neck squame cell RNA-seq data. Um, this is just publicly available data um, on Xenohub that you can pull down. Um, there's a couple of interesting points going on here. You can see the checksum, for example, so that ensures that you have the exact same data type. And I think that that's really powerful because sometimes, you know, the data could have changed underneath or somebody could have reran it, put it, pushed over on S3, et cetera. Um, and then this is just loading the, the various packages as well. Um, some interesting points is just being able to reproduce that argument in a quick and succinct way. Um, versus like somebody forgetting to do git commit and then pushing a bunch of stuff over it and you can't and then you have to go back and kind of unearth what they changed along the way and why they changed it. Um, so I just think that that's really powerful and this is all in like a data um format and you can just continue including new and new, more and more data sets that you want in there. So again, just kind of going over some of the various things, lots of different storage loaders and backends, support for S3, web, uh, local files, um, all kinds of stuff. You have metadata as well of like what is this data set um, that this person is pulling in um, in a quick and succinct way that's like repeatable and easy for them to think of. There's also checksums um, and then you can also have the storage loader arguments as well and just have those quick and easy to reproduce. Um, and so just where I think that this is also powerful is then you can start swapping around your types for the various things that you're loading as well, um, like phenotypes. Here we can load as a matrix um, and say we want the dimensions to be one on that and take the mean of it. Or we can also load as an array and do dimensions of one as well and just swap those around. So if you're interested in that, check it out on Friday. Uh, he'll go really in depth on, on all the other things. You can load images, all kinds of stuff. Um, I think it's pretty big for reproducible analysis in that sense as compared to like ML data sets that's a little bit um, more static data sets, whereas this is, you can also check in your results as well, um, which I think are important. So let's talk about the ecosystem. Um, so I threw together some of these tables and I'm gonna put these on the new docs and we'll talk about those in a moment, but just kind of some quick comparisons of like various packages that um, are of interest to people. So I kind of broke this up into general utilities first. So this is just your, your standard plotting and some of the popular ones. And of course you have polars and pandas and data frames. Um, but then we start to get more interesting in the biological file formats. I didn't finish fleshing out the R ones uh, just yet. Um, on those for phylogeny, um, and you could use G ranges, I guess, for GFF. Um, so you have SAM tools, um, reading in various uh, BAM for files as well, FASCU files, variants, um, building phylogenies, biostructures as well um, for proteins down there. 
and as you can see, BioPython really has a lot of the um, real estate in the Python ecosystem on that. They might even have a VCF package. I might have missed that. Um, and then going into like some of the genomic analyses of that, of like you got your genomic ranges um, over there. You can run BLAST as well locally if you really wanted to. Um, you have your DNA, RNA, and, and manipulating those sequences. Um, and so again, just kind of an overview, a good reference for some people. I kind of always wanted to compare and see how many packages was Julia missing, and it doesn't seem like they're missing many that I could think of, but I'll be interested to see if others can contribute to that and find where there are pieces missing. So what about when you can't replace a popular package? Um, so the analogy that my PI made when I was talking about this um, and presenting these slides was he said, like, working in R and Python is like buying a house in, D in, in the center of DFW. Um, and so DFW is like the epitome of urban sprawl. Um, as well. So like if you buy it in downtown, you're constantly having redevelopment, you know, PIP, Poetry, Hatch, PIP Tools, Conda, the tooling's changing, you know, versions are getting updated underneath you. And then like compared to the suburbs where things are nice and planned out and there's a package for each thing and people are working together, et cetera. Um, but you need a car is the real kicker. So um, this urban sprawl of that of like, you know, you have DC, EDGAR, Surat, ScanPy, ggplot if you have like a custom plotting format as well that you really want. So what do you do? We have various Julia interop packages as well, um, like R call, Python call, um, and then you can also just call the command line tools from Julia and it's really easy and baked in and I think better than the alternatives in other languages. So R call is pretty simple. Um, you can just install these packages. Uh, this is just a simple ggplot2. Example, the nice thing as well is it gives you an R REPL, so you can continue the REPL driven development. And then I just wanted to give a Python call example as well that I used earlier. Um, I cut off some of it for the sake of the slides, but so this is the Python example, and then I thought this was pretty cool when you just swap it in, you actually just lose a couple lines of code because you don't have to do the swap to TensorFlow, et cetera, in the loading of that from those, you can just use the, the Julia array type. And so it's pretty much the same. So you can take these old analyses. You can also call an entire Python file as well, which I thought was cool. Um, so old analyses that people already have that you just wanna use, you can just call that whole file and take the output. And then just to kind of touch on this as well, for anyone watching, uh, Python call and PyCall are two different packages. I think the issue is that PyCall doesn't reference this um, as well, and that's mainly because Python call doesn't have to support as much legacy stuff as PyCall does. Um, also uses Conda package, and then you can also use them both at the same time, so there's no real trade-off. Um, so we can also talk a little bit about managing Conda environments in Julia. Conda, I think, is pretty good for managing these things for most cases because you have Python and R packaged up in those, um, at least for scientific analysis on that. And so this is all you have to do with the conda package to do, to add a, to just manipulate those conda environments. And that's all right, but I thought that conda package um, had a little bit nicer interface for anyone that, that wasn't familiar with it. Um, and so basically you can just add these, add your channels and kind of use the conda environment in a more native way of that sense. And then the real powerful part is the conda package.toml as well. And that just allows you to instantly reproduce that entire environment from that and check it in. So um, what about like command line tools as well and various binaries? And there's a new effort as well to package up some of these binaries. Um, so you can just do pkg install on those. So basically you can just call your commands um, based on those just using backticks. Um, pretty simple, and then you can just run that command with that. That's it, like, compared to, you know, Python where there's like six different ways to run it, I feel like. Um, and I've linked to the docs down there as well. And then, so you can also then manipulate with multiple files and start getting into more complicated stuff. I'd probably drop to a workflow manager um, personally, but so then you can use like BWA and pass all those reads in. So the other thing that I thought was cool in Julia is it seems like the packages plug in better than other ecosystems. Um, and I thought this was a good example from the bed graph uh, files package 
that they had. So you can just load it into a data table um, out of the box. It just works because it implements the same interface. Um, you can also load it into an index table as well because it just uses the same interface. And then you can just plot it directly with Gadfly because, again, the interface of these. And then it also works with qu query down there as most of them do. Um, most of the BioGelia packages do that are loading these various things. And so you can start using the filter macros, for example, and just save it, and it just kind of all works together nicely. Um, another thing that I, that I think is going to be really important in the future is the BioGelia docs, um, and that's just kind of an effort to join up all of the various docs. That's one thing when I was first getting started with all this was finding the various documentation and then this package calls that package and then you're like finding this in the lower level package has the examples for the upper level package and I think some more unity in these is going to be really beneficial for new users and finding these things because I think that's one thing that R and Python do get right is just examples. So uh, in bioinformatics, it's very common to use workflow managers, so let's talk about those for a moment and the Julia experience in that. Um, so let's start out with SnakeMake. I'd seen this for many years. I've had the optionality to run a Julia script and then finally actually used it. Um, so this is just pulling in, a, in a, the Iris data set up there um, with the remote, and then you have your input from that, your output, which is just going to be CSV, and then we're just using the Julia Docker container for this as well. And then this is just a snake make script um, for that. And the interesting part is you can then access this Julia or this snake make object inside of your workflow manager um, on those. So that snake make dot input traces back to this input here. And that would be the iris data set, for example, on that and loading those up. And then the CSV write on the output you can then just reference in that, that's gonna be the out.csv. And so that's really powerful. And then you can start referencing various configs and various params from that as well. Um, so Julia can just kind of plug into SnakeMake there and you can start using it. So uh, personally, I use a lot more Nextflow as well. Um, so my friend Alex um, figured this out in like, I think 2019. Um, and started getting into Julia. The issue, and I think I walked in on a conversation earlier on it, of using containers with Julia is then it tries to write to your dot Julia, the like main depot um, path of it. And the problem is that that's not always writable um, in all cases. So what this actually does is this little environment is just how NextFlow like bootstraps onto your various environment variables. And so then that will write to a correct path that you can actually manage on those. Um, so that's just kind of an intro, like you would probably want to do that in SnakeMake as well, but that came from NF Core um, on that part. So uh, what that would look like in NextFlow, on the other hand, uh, we're just using the same container on that. And so in NextFlow, you can also call it as a shebang, like just use the shebang and call that shell function on that. So you can just throw the Julia script into the same process. Um, on those, you would also you also need to install the Julia packages here, but I cut that out for space on the slide. Um, and this is just again loading up the basic CSV file, and then you can reference that using that variable inside the script, um, which looks nice for some of those. Um, but you also can't reference the output in Nextflow, is going to be the the issue. And then on the other hand, you can also just call Julia and call the hello.jl, and then pass the CSV file in that way. Um, and then this is what then your Julia file would look like on the other hand, and then you have your print the line of the program file, and those are just some basics from the running Julia as a script on the documentation. And then you just chmod the, the script, and it magically packages it in um, via Nextflow. So let's talk about a quick little analysis on that. Um, this is one that I did a while ago on just overlapping some H3K27 acetylations and some P63 peaks um, to identify these enhancer regions. So basically the cool part of this is just being able to pull in this raw file um, of those and checking for that file, and if not, then we're gonna download it from the internet. You could also use data toolkit, et cetera, on those, but this was just kind of a basic example from, uh, I think it was Julia for data analysis at the time, and then you can use genomic features in, and using BED. Um, and then we're just going to read those in using the bed reader as well. And then that pulls into this interesting uh, like type of interval 
collections as well, and that's iterable. And so then you can just simply call each overlap on these, um, and that is just a function that works with both of those and overlaps them. Um, and then I just took the first off of it to see what was happening, and then you can just collect all of them and write it to a bed file. So, let's see, in conclusion. Uh, so where do I feel that Julia is kind of lacking or like where, where some people in bioinformatics might say, well, yeah, I'd, I don't really wanna use that. So creating binaries and CLIs, um, Python works pretty well for creating CLIs on those. Um, there's some efforts on that. And then like one thing that my lab group asked, so like what about Rust? Like that's what everybody's talking about. And it seems like Rust is going to be better for creating tools like aligners and whatnot, um, variant calling maybe, and then Julia for the actual analysis of those and being able to interopt between various things. And so that's where I kind of see, see the ecosystem going in that sense for those. So, a couple of resources up there. There's the bio tutorials, um, which are some tutorial notebooks for BioJulia, and then the new documenter.jl docs as well. current head of the BioGuilla Docs Initiative, that made my day, we included it. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, for the BioGuilla Docs, did it come by default in light mode, or did you have like, more selected on your browser? Uh, I think I have it selected on my browser. Okay, so we actually have another issue with Docs Center not being in Docs mode before, so mm. take care of. Uh, secondly, what are actually the differences between Julia Artifacts and the Data Toolkit package? And the Data Toolkit package? Yeah, I think it actually uses Julia Artifacts under the hood. You'd have to ask Tim about that but he'd be very happy to talk about that. <laughs> I think that's what it does. Yeah. Yeah, quick question on, um, have you um, done uh, GWAS or genome-wide association studies using Biojulia or other? I have not. Uh, so, because you're showing um, some of the green flags in the other ones, that the processing with, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. basically what that means is that we can tell you the files. So, uh, are there uh, packages that can do uh, GWAS with Julia? I do not know. Anyway? I was just asked to Google it. I think there is a GWAS.jl. I don't know how well it's maintained. Right. Yeah, but it's, it's not in BioJulia. But um, I, think, I think all of the components are there somewhere. Um, I don't. Oh, oh yeah, I mean, there's this organization called Open Mendel that I stumbled on recently that has a ton of packages, but their people don't seem to be on Slack or Zulip, so I never interact with them. But there's tons of packages in the Open Mendel, and they have an ordinal GWAS package. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. And, and, and polygenic risk scores and things like that. Could be. I, I would look in that, that repository. Like, I don't, I'm not familiar with hardly any of the packages yeah. in that organization, but there's a bunch of them. I remember mean, being very surprised at how much <laughs> it's like one lap. I don't know. Well, what is the CLI stands for? Yeah, sorry, uh, command line interface. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, oh, not, that kind of stuff. So what you'd be experiencing on those. I think there is an AF core pipeline for GWAS, though, if you're interested. How far along do you see the engineering to making like binaries? Because we're very eager to do I am not the expert on that. I've heard various, you know, things. Anybody else knows me? I mean, it's, it's not easy, and they're big. So, I mean, you can do it. Um, I would say that if you want to make a binary package that someone's going to call like Bowtie or something, Julia is probably not the best. We just found that there are current efforts for uh, building binaries for Julia. I think the name of package was static compiler, which is an in-concept uh, uh, binary generator. It only supports currently a subset of the Julia language, but we should see over the years if there's more effort put into it, eventually it could be full support for generating binaries. It was very high up on the wish list that we saw earlier today, so I think that they know that it's a lot of people want this. What was the package? 
I think it was either a static compiler or packed compiler, one of those two. Other questions? Yeah. How do you feel like the within bioinformatics community shift towards Julius? Do you think there's like an actual flow from other packages or other programming languages into Julia right now? Or do you think it's like still fairly like mm. not really? I think that's kind of why I wanted to give the talk was I kind of wanted to answer the questions for myself of like, you know, the various package ecosystems and you're like, oh, well, there's all these packages in R and Python and they've already kind of like won in that sense. And so I hope that there's a flow of people moving into it in that sense and kind of proving that you can just do the analysis in that and then do it in a simpler way. Do we have... So, like R, yeah, and uh, it does not have the shitty package control that uh, Python has. Yeah. yeah. So Python, I I lost my hair just because of Python. Yeah. So I'm trying to to match things like that. I'm doing. That's right. Why would you call? Would we want to call from Julia Python? Because mm -hmm. you have to deal with the same problems again. You have to call the, the packages that and that matches on one that one. I mean, it's a nightmare. I can tell you've been hurt too. <laughs> Two slightly divergent questions. So the first is, um, when are we going to make a workflow orchestrator in Julia? It's been on my wish list for ages, and I keep thinking I'm going to build it, and it just doesn't seem worth the development time. But I really want it. And the second thing is, uh, this is sort of getting weird too. Do you think that we need to get Julia into Conda somehow, so that we can go in that direction to get more of the people who are used to? using managing Conda environments, access to Julia tools. Hmm. Okay, let's answer the Conda and Julia. I thought there was already a Conda package for Julia, right? Yeah, so you can install it in that way, but then you have to, like, yeah, I, I don't, like, the whole, like, R sticking all the packages in Conda just sounds, like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> or, like, I feel like that's just going to be more pain than I, yeah. worth of, like, just explaining them, like, no, 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 just install with PKG. Uh, workflow manager, there actually is someone who wrote one. They also wrote a job scheduler in Julia as well, but I don't know if it hooks into like multiple computers or, or whatnot. They gave a talk on it yesterday online. Uh, I think it's called pipelines.jl. So that looked interesting. I don't know, like, yeah, syntactically getting these workflow managers right, I feel is really hard. That's where you've kind of converged onto. Yeah. And what about the managers like the DBC or Airflow or like more standard? That's always, a, that's always a great question. I think the issue with those is they expect a singular environment is what I've, I've seen is like they expect you to like use Python all the way down. And it's like, okay, I'm gonna use like Python for like a snippet of this and the rest is gonna be plugging in command line tools. We also, Bioinformatics also works in like a file format very typically, whereas those would work maybe in memory a lot and just passing around data frames. So that's kind of the issue with those. So yeah, you can use that if you wanted to. I feel like you're going to end up causing yourself more pain versus a workflow manager that like, expects it. And another advantage I think is that uh, in, in much of the uh, bioinformatics uh, workflows, we tend to use Sedel Bock for pattern matching and regular expressions. So using Julia might be a little bit uh, more contagious that is a pretty mature R in that way. Yeah. But also, you, know, you can just call uh, like you don't have to get rid of those crazy pattern kind of matches that you already have. You can just call Hawk and said from Julia or from those various workflow managers. You know that I was mentioning. That's typically what we want. Do we have a last question? What time for last quick question? I can have another one if nobody yes. else has it. Yeah. No. Uh, out of all the, those, uh, so the only thing that I, that, that I think I'm still using R for is to plot to use ggplot to like a more extended plot. I know that I used it a while ago at Gaspar, but it was a downgrade, let's say, in ggplot to add the others to approaching like the functionality for like ggplot to plots and makey. Uh, I still like I was trying to do a custom plot a while ago of like basically it's uh, like for that um, for the head and neck squamous cell and like plotting each of these samples comparatively. Um, based on a couple genes. And so exactly, you're like constantly like searching and, and really trying to hunt for it, whereas then sometimes those plots are just there. 
And you know, that's okay. Like you can just run ggplot2, run it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Let's all thank Edmund one more time. Okay, uh, I'm very ha happy to have Garik, is that the correct pronunciation? Yeah. Uh, Garik here, uh, who's going to talk about screening of uh, chemical libraries. Please go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Garik. I'm a machine learning researcher at Biosim AI, which is a computational drug discovery startup. And today I will speak about virtual screening and our library that enables uh, fast and really high accuracy screening of multi-billion compound libraries. The virtual screening is an important part of drug discovery pipeline. In drug discovery, we start from some protein that we want to target. And our goal is to find a small molecule that will bind to this protein and change its behavior. So to do that, we start from a large library that contains several billion molecules and filter it step by step to obtain five or 10 molecules that can be used, uh, tested on animals and later on humans. So using our package, you can uh, do the first step move from several billion uh, compounds to uh, 1,000 hits. But even if you consider a case when we have just one molecule, the problem itself is hard, because there are so many degrees of freedom for a molecule. And uh, there are many confirmations that the molecule can have inside the pocket. So uh, here you can see several of confirmations colored with different colors. So the problem is hard even for a single molecule, and we want to get binding affinities, the interaction energies, for several billion molecules. To do that, we have developed several Julia packages. One of those packages is BiosimDoc that solves this single molecule case. Biosim probes predicts properties for a given molecule, because for a molecule to be used as a drug, it should satisfy many constraints, should have uh, some properties that can be predicted using Biosim probes. Biosim data finds uh, similar molecules to your drug because we are interested in novelty of our molecules, of our drugs. And Biosim Pocket Finder can be used to find all the pockets that can be targeted in drug discovery in virtual screening campaign. Biosim Virtual Screening combines these packages and many other packages to do distributed screen screening of multi-billion libraries. This uh, pocket finder is an interesting case. It takes as an input the protein and uh, gives you all uh, pockets that you can use for screening. So uh, we initially developed it using Python and NumPy. But later we moved from Python to Julia and achieved 100x speed improvement. Overall pipeline of uh, Biosyn virtual screening starts from this large library. We select rand randomly select some fraction of this library and dock it using Biosim doc, the package, docking package. Later we train fast machine learning model to predict the binding affinities that we get from Biosim doc, and calculate scores for whole library, and uh, filter the library according to properties and also the binding affinity. So after that we select some uh, new part of this library based on model uncertainty and properties and update our training set. So we continue this cycle several times, and after that, we, we can take 1,000 best molecules that uh, will give us the heats, which have high binding affinity and also good properties. Of course, it is impossible to do this on a single machine. Therefore, uh, Biosyn Virtual Screening is a distributed package. It has the central manager that creates the nodes and uh, removes them, and also orchestrates the whole work uh, that these, node, uh, these nodes do. And each node has its main process that speaks to uh, central managers, this orchestrator, and also distributes tasks between worker processes. Because there are many types of tasks, like train machine learning models, 
to docking, predict scores, pr predict properties, update database, and so many others. And each worker has its own SQL database. Each, each node has its own SQL database, but workers uh, put their metadata and some other information. Also, for each node, we have machine learning models that they use to make predictions. So here we can see how we can use docking client to do docking. So to do that, you just use a Biosim docking client package and choose the protein that you want to target in your uh, docking. So when you have chosen your uh, protein, you can ask our model to uh, offer you a pocket or you can choose a pocket yourself. So in this case, we see that this uh, protein has only one pocket, this red one. So we will target it during the docking. You can choose one molecule or a list of molecules for docking. So here we have this large enough molecule. And that's it. We provide a smile list or we can give mol2 files. And after the docking, we can see the report, which gives us uh, binding affinities, the energies for the, mo for the list of molecules that we have provided. And for each molecule, it also gives several conformations that you can choose from later. You, if you have the crystal, you know the, the answer, you can calculate doc RMSD, the deviation between the answer and the, your prediction. And also you can visualize uh, docking results to see the interactions and uh, how our model chose, has chosen uh, the binding pose. So if you give uh, a molecule, that, a protein that has several pockets, it will provide all the pockets and you can choose which one you want to target in uh, your docking. Of course, accuracy is very important. And here we compare Biosim Doc with Autodoc Vina. Autodoc Vina is a public op open source uh, docking program uh, which has really good accuracy. And uh, the paper has more than 25,000 citations. There are many papers that show that Autodoc Vina outperforms not only open source docking tools, but also commercially available docking programs. And there are many drug discovery campaigns that have used uh, Autodoc Vina. And also we compare it with uh, DivDoc, which is uh, using diffusion denoising process to find a binding pose inside the pocket. It is built here at MIT. So as you can see, Biosim Doc outperforms both Autodoc Vina and DivDoc with a huge margin. But only accuracy isn't enough. Because the library, libraries are big, we also need speed, high speed. And again, we compare it with Autodoc Vina and DivDoc. And as you can see, Biosim Doc is several times faster than Autodoc Vina. And it is uh, a little bit, so here, here we compare DivDoc uh, running time, which is uh, on GPU. And our running time is on, on a single core. So on a single core, Biosim Doc is a little bit like, DivDoc is a little bit faster, but it is down on GPU. If, but if you want to do large uh, virtual screening, it's obvious that the cost between GPU, the cost difference between GPU and CPU is huge. So that's it. Uh, get in touch. I'll be happy to give you access to our docking tool. It will be free for academic use. It is now integrated in Deep Origin platform where you can use the uh, Jupyter Notebook that I've shown you. And also we are open for collaboration, so feel free to get in touch. Can you say anything about how the docking is actually done? What, what is computed? Yeah. Uh, so it is multi-stage docking. We do search with several algorithms, and later we use machine learning models to choose the best binding poses. So actually, first you choose how the dock should be used with binding poses, or maybe correct? So, so, so you're only targeting the pockets, if I understand correctly. Yeah, but but you can use a pocket finder first to get the pocket, and after that, yeah, the docking part only targets the pocket. A quick one. Um, so, with this, it looks like you've achieved something quite uh, interesting. How much of the, this work is actually publicly available, and how much is uh, behind closed doors? Yeah. So, 
we provide a Jupyter notebook that I've shown you, so you can use it for academic purposes. But the main code, the backend part, isn't publicly available because we are a drug discovery company, so it's intellectual property. But you can play with it, you can run it, so get results. Just back end code that you hold on to, and that's all. Yeah, like it's, it's intellectual properties card, yeah. Yeah. But for for user, it doesn't matter. I think that much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, okay. Uh, next. Yeah. Please uh, come on. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Rafael uh, Arugo, is that what? Rafael Arugo? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, some bio. Okay, uh, uh, he's going to talk about uh, unsupervised clustering, uh, and are we now leaving the biology behind us, or? Yes. Yes, <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> we'll have a couple of really good talks coming up now. Uh, whenever they're biology related or not, I can't tell from the title. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to hold up this one so you know, like, Okay. Can I stop? Yes. Okay. So, welcome everyone, my name is Rafael, and today I'll talk about the unsupervised clustering package. Uh, this package was initially developed by me during my master's, and today, oh sorry, should I start again? Okay, so welcome everyone, my name is Rafael, and today I'll talk about the unsupervised clustering package. I, this, this package was initially developed by me during my master's, and today is used internally by our team at the company that I work for. So before I begin, let me share a bit about my journey. I graduated from Pukehio in a Bachelor of Computer, Science, Computer Engineering. I had the opportunity to study abroad at the University of Illinois. And I also hold a master's degree also from Pukehio. And since 2016, I've been working at PSR Energy and at PSR, we host more than 20 Julia developers, and we published more than two, 10 Julia packages. So unsupervised clustering algorithms allows us to group unlabeled data uh, into clusters based on similarity. Uh, among several algorithms, k-means stands out, both for its simplicity and for its performance. There's also model-based uh, approaches like Gaussian mixture models, which are capable of feeding more complex structures. However, GMMs require more uh, uh, estimating a large number of parameters, which can be challenging. So speaking of challenges, estimating covariances can result in new conditioned matrices and numerical instabilities. instabilities. Also, these problems involve a large number of local minima, which can lead to solutions that overfit the data. Given this, these challenges, uh, we aim to develop efficient algorithms for general GMMs using regularization and global optimization techniques, and provide two packages, unsupervised, unsupervised clustering and regularized covariance matrices. Okay, so here's a simple example how we can use the package. First, we are generating some random data, and then we instantiate the empirical covariance struct. Algorithm and get the results. Okay, so to handle the numerical issues of GMM, we use the regularization techniques. These methods involve blending the empirical matrix with a scaled identity matrix. And the package, the, the regularized covariance package, uh, implements three different approaches to calibrate these regularization parameter delta. Okay, here's another example based on the last one. Uh, here we just changed the estimator to use the shrunk one. Uh, in, in the other example, we used the empirical one. Okay, so as you already 
uh, talk about it, the large number of local minima is a challenge. And to overcome this, we use metaheuristics like integrated local search and genetic algorithms. And uh, we have, uh, have developed a hybrid genetic search algorithm that combine uh, classical variation operators with local improvements using GMMs. So the general structure of the genetic search involves several steps, including initializing the population, parent selection, crossover, mutation operators, local improvement, and after that, we manage to select the survivors. We manage the population. Here's a visualization of the crossover operator. Given the two parents, parent one and parent two, we match the closest cluster uh, of the two parents using the Hungarian algorithm. And then we select a random cluster within each pair and generate the offspring. And here is an example of the mutation operator. Um, so the mutation operator selects a random cluster represented by the red cross and a random data point represented by the blue cross. Um, and then it swaps the cluster position. So we use, after we swap the cluster position, we use the other cluster shapes to keep the covariance matrices within the same magnitude. And then we apply the GMM to do our local improvement, the last uh, figure. OK, here's another example based on the last one. Uh, so we just added this line marked with the arrow, uh, calling the genetic algorithm, passing the local search as the GMM trunk. And we call the fit function, and the algorithm runs. OK, so to test our approach, we conducted extensive computational analysis. And we also generated synthetic data sets with different structures. Uh, and to measure the quality of the results, we calculated the adjusted rand index for each data set and method. So here is four examples of our synthetic uh, data sets. And here is some of our findings. So the rand index has a maximum value of 1, which occurs when the clusters are identical. So when it's 1, it's perfect. And the rand index, when the rand index has a value of 0, uh, it indicates that the clusters are no better than random assignments. So the darker the color, the closest to 1, the better results we have. So all these four algorithms have on the package uh, the last one, we got the best results. And the results shows that regularization alone does not make a significant difference. And genetic algorithms overfits when the dimensions grow. However, combining both regularization techniques and genetic search greatly improved the cluster recovery. OK, this slide presents the comparison with k-means. The results show that k means is really competitive when the clusters are separated. But, well, it's really competi competitive uh, in any case. Uh, but when the clusters are more mixed, the k means uh, is slightly worse. OK, so our package has found some real world application that PSR, the company that I work for, we use Julia 1.9 and packagecompiler.jl to distribute uh, to over 300 clients over the world. The first, the first application here is to cluster hourly demands into blocks of demands. Uh, this approach accelerates our op optimization model executions while ensuring high quality results. Uh, the second application is one that we cluster the renewable scenarios that our stochastic models produce to preserve the statistics, statistical properties. These approaches um, efficiently handle large-scale problems and optimize resources while maintaining system resilience and reliability. So, um, in conclusion, we introduced a clustering package that implements several clustering approaches that also includes GMM, regularization, and global optimization.
uh, our tests with different regularization strategies have greatly improved the cluster uh, recovery and our proposed methods have consistently outperformed classical GMM and classical K-means on many data sets. So for more information, we can check the packages and reach out uh, the paper. Thank you for attention, and now I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, a quick question. Um, interesting what you've done there. Um, something I'm curious about, though, is that given that we already have, for example, the clustering.jl package, yes. uh, what motivated you to actually make this its own package as opposed to working on um, improving that one? Okay, so uh, I did this package during my master's, so I had to uh, do a lot of testings and change some things. Uh, basically, the clustering.jl package uh, have a lot of local searches, and uh, it has like a function calls that is slightly different from this package. Here we have like structures uh, of the algorithms, and then we call like the fit, fit function to uh, to run the algorithm within the the, the algorithm. Uh, and then do, by doing this, we can mix a lot of algorithms. So we have a thing like a clustering chain in this package that we can run a k-means, and afterwards we can run a GMM. So we can chain several cluster, uh, clustering algorithms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I will. Yeah. I'd like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Benoit Legat. Is that the correct, pro correct pronunciation? Very good. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, polyhedral computation. So as soon as you're ready, I'll start. I'm ready. So um, today I'm going to present uh, polyhedral computation in Julia. So I first explain uh, what this is. So it's better explained by just uh, this picture. So what we always have to do in polyhedral computation is suppose you have a cloud of points and you want to obtain the convex hull of this cloud of points. And once you obtain the convex hull of this point of point, which is uh, shown in blue, uh, you can actually represent it by all its faces. And all these faces in 3D, uh, these are planes, but in higher dimensions, these are hyperplanes. So basically this description says here's a list of hyperplanes. Uh, the polyhedron is on that side of all these hyperplanes. So for every hyperplanes, you have a site. And so you have this kind of dual description, the V representation with the points and the H representation with the hyperplanes. And so this is uh, very useful. For example, it's huge in reachability analysis uh, for computing invariant sets. Uh, the Delaunay tessellation is actually a problem that's closely related. It's also used in game theory. And optimization is also very important because, for example, when you do mixed integer linear programming, the ideal formulation you want to do is you take all the integer points of your problem, and when you take the, of the H representation of that, it gives you all the constraint that you should give to jump so that if you remove the integrality constraints, uh, you still have only the integrality points as optimal solutions. So it's used in, in many problems, and there are actually many different uh, libraries that exist. So there are um, CDD, LRS, QHUL, and so on. These are uh, usually uh, written in C or C++. And then uh, there are also um, no implementation in pure Julia as well. 
Now, um, one paper that I really like, which is this one from 1995, shows that actually what's tricky with this is that there is no uh, best, uh, best method for everything. Actually, these different libraries, they, use, uh, they can be uh, described with three different algorithms. There is the double description one, the reverse search one, and the quick hull one. And actually, depending on your polyhedron, so if you read that paper, then to tell you which property of the polyhedron actually matters. And so depending on the class of polyhedra that you have, one of the three is going to be much better asymptotically uh, to the other one. And if you look at it, like the implementation is not so important here, of course, to which one is going to be faster. It's really the, uh, the complexity. Even uh, the ones that are using rational big int as, uh, as arithmetic, so they are, uh, of course, they are uh, much slower to do every single operation, but are still going to beat the one in floating 64 or in rational of int if um, uh, just because the algorithm is better uh, suited. So, and so because of that, if you look at actually some, some libraries uh, to compute invariant sets um, in, in, in some other languages, they actually have a hard-coded fixed library that they are going to use for uh, every operation that they need to do. And so in a sense, uh, while um, this you, you already know in advance that this is not going to work for some use case because on some use case you might have a polyhedron in the class where double description is very bad. And so it's very important whenever you design an algorithm that's going to require doing polyhedral computation that you do not hard code the library that you are going to use because then there is always one user that will use one instance for which your, uh, your algorithm then is going to be not good. So you always want to parameterize your algorithm on the library so that the user can then, for is your case, try all the libraries and then choose the one for which its class of polyhedron uh, is going to be fast for its class. So it's important to parameterize that. And I mean, the user doesn't have to see in which class it is. He can just try uh, all the possibilities. And so a second aspect uh, that is quite challenging uh, for this is that actually in all the different operations uh, that you can do, so you, you see that you have these two uh, representations for polyhedron. It's actually quite uh, computationally intensive to go from the vertex representation to the hyperplane and vice versa. And actually, usually, sometimes when you do some operation, you need to be in one of the two representations. And sometimes uh, you, do, you, you create it in the V representation, but then maybe you want to take some intersection, so you need to convert to the H representation, and so the in intersection would be in H representation, and then the user might want to multiply this, um, this intersection by a matrix, so then you need to be in V representation, and so on. And all this bookkeeping of uh, you know, doing this representation conversion at the right time, but not when it's not needed, it's making the code very complex. And so uh, the goal of polyhedra uh, was to try to make this uh, all uh, transparent. And so in, in the polyhedra DGL package, we have the V and H representation uh, that you can describe. You, H representation, you can easily obtain it from a jump model. And then the polyhedra type, it kind of contains the two, but only, it, maybe it contains only the H, maybe only the V, or maybe both. And it's going to, uh, depending on which, which operation you do, trying to automatically convert uh, uh, when needed, and trying to make this transparent, but it's also easy to see uh, what he has done. And then, so we have this interface, and then we, we've tried to wrap all the different libraries in Julia with the same interface, so that when you build a polyhedron, you can say which library you want underneath, and then, because you use this abstract interface, your code is not actually going to depend on which library you use, uh, but depending on the library, uh, what's happening underneath is going to be very different. So. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, please. Maybe a kind of weird question, but uh, do you have any idea how we could simplify uh, multidimensional polyhedra? Whatever simplify means, like getting a representation of, for example, less vertices or less half space. Um, so this is going to depend a lot on what kind of operation you want to do on this polyhedron. Uh, the optimization problem, and it's a feasible region. And a feasible region is too complicated, so I want to kind of simplify the feasible region. Yes. So this is, uh, 
this is something that opens, happens a lot. So when you do mixed integer linear programming, usually the feasible set you want to use because it's a feasible set for which when you remove the integrality constraint, you will only find integer uh, solution. This sometimes have way too many hard spaces. And so the, typically what you can do is that you, you sometimes do not give some of these uh, constraints. Uh, and you might give them later with jump with like lazy constraints. But another approach that's uh, very common is to try to lift the space. Because sometimes the polyhedron is very complicated because it's a, a new variable increasing the dimension. You find the representation of your polyhedron with much less faces. And your polyhedron that you had initially is just the projection. And when you do the projection operation, so I had it on the previous slide, you can see that for the h rep, it's a red arrow. Uh, what I mean by red here is that it's going to be uh, not ideal. So projection is easy to do for the V representation because the projection has basically as many points and many vertices or maybe even less if they are projected to zero. But from the H representation when you project, the number of uh, vertices can grow uh, significantly. Uh, it's the Fourier Motzkin algorithm and uh, for, I, for every dimension that you project, uh, it, can, it can explode. Uh, let's thank Spinoa one more time. Uh, we have the next speaker. Uh, ah, yeah, please. Uh, so I just want to inform also that at 6 p.m. on the fourth floor, there's going to be a poster session, and there's going to be appetizers with the poster session. Uh, so please, everyone, come to that one as well. Uh, it's going to be very good. Okay, uh, so next speaker, I think it's... Uh, Antonis Skouritis? Skouritis? Yes. Yes, uh, like he said it. <laughs> uh, and he's going to talk about uh, adapted hierarchical regular binning. Uh, well, uh, let's say about four words are good enough. But it's not a word that I recognize at all. So I'm very excited to hear about that one. Uh, yeah. All right, so uh, my name is uh, Antonio Skurtis. I'm an uh, undergraduate student of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki uh, under the Faculty of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Engineering. Uh, I will be presenting uh, uh, Adaptive Hierarchical Regular Binning, which is a package that I've been developing alongside my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dimitris Floros, uh, Professor Nikos Pitsianis, and Professor uh, Ziao Baisan. So this presentation is uh, split into three main parts. And uh, the first one is the introduction, where I will be presenting the main functionality of uh, the package uh, alongside uh, some uh, downstream uh, uh, scenarios so that the package can uh, be used. Uh, I will also present uh, benchmarks and uh, the basic properties of the package. Uh, the next one is uh, user interface and uh, code snippets. and um, in this section, I will show some basic examples of its usage uh, and uh, in, the, in the setting of, in a rudimentary setting uh, that will explain uh, how the package is used. Um, lastly, the development part uh, is uh, where we will take a deeper dive into the implementation the details of the package. And that's all for the outline. All right, so adaptive hierarchical uh, regular binning, or ARB for short, uh, the H is not, uh, is silent, uh, computes a hierarchical uh, tree that bins particles into cubes uh, while also adapting to the data content uh, density. Uh, so this is actually the main functionality of ARB. And uh, ARB can be used uh, by downstream tasks, such as uh, non-linear dimension uh, non reduction, 
uh, which is a process that uh, utilizes near neighbors and uh, ARB uh, offers efficient queries that uh, speed up such, uh, such searches. Uh, one example is the Swiss roll depicted in uh, the images to the right. Uh, and uh, the Swiss roll is a 2D uh, structure, two-dimensional structure, embedded in, the, in a three-dimensional space. So nonlinear dimensional reduction basically uh, unrolls that structure, revealing its uh, true shape. And uh, such structures can exist in higher dimensions and uh, are, uh, aims to facilitate uh, these cases, the uh, higher dimensional, dimensional ones. So, ARB accepts uh, a source uh, and the target set of particles in a high dimensional space alongside the two control uh, parameters, Lmax and Pmax. Uh, these parameters uh, control the uh, maximum number of partition levels of the space. And uh, the other one, the Pmax, controls the population threshold of the inner nodes. And by inner nodes, I mean the, the non-terminal nodes of uh, the computed tree. Uh, so, yes, the result is an annotated uh, tree structure, and by annotated I mean uh, that uh, there are several accessor functions that can provide useful information to the user. Uh, such such uh, accessor functions uh, can retrieve uh, the particles that are contained within uh, the bin, uh, or perhaps uh, the neighboring boxes of the bin. Uh, so, spatially, each node of this tree can be represented by a hypercube, and uh, parent, hi parent hypercubes contain uh, their children, as seen in the example image uh, we have in the slide. Uh, note that uh, empty boxes are not depicted since uh, they are not computed. And note that uh, this is a three-dimensional example, but ARB aims to solve uh, higher dimensional problems. This is only for demonstration. Um, so the output tree can be queried efficiently, and such queries can be, for example, uh, get leaf box, which for a random particle uh, inside a high dimensional space uh, retrieves the smallest tree node that contains that particle. Uh, another query can be, for example, a get neighbors of a box, uh, which retrieves the boxes uh, directly adjacent to the queried box. Uh, getting the neighbors of a box can result into interaction lists for each point within the tree, or uh, in other words, an, inter an interaction matrix for all the points in the tree. Uh, filtering out uh, uh, far field interactions is what ARB actually uh, can offer uh, without computing the pairwise distances uh, of that far field interactions. So, uh, to the right, uh, the image depicts uh, uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, problem where all interactions would have to be computed in an exhaustive search, uh, but using ARB, uh, only the gray areas need to be computed. Uh, and the blue areas the, are the actual results of uh, the interactions. So, here we will be presenting, I will be presenting some uh, downstream task scenarios, and there is a plethora uh, of tasks uh, that ARP can be utilized for. Uh, and uh, keep in mind that tasks of high dimensionality is the target goal of ARP. So the first one is uh, image processing, uh, and more specifically, uh, super pixel segmentation, uh, which can be used for data compression. Uh, data like these uh, are not two dimensional, Rather, they are five-dimensional. Uh, they have two dimensions for pixel space and uh, three dimensions for color, in color information. Uh, another example is the one to the top right, uh, which is the, uh, a data set of gene cell barcodes. And such data sets uh, can be utilized to find uh, similarities in, uh, between cells. Uh, but these data sets have really high dimensionalities. and. Uh, uh, even though there are techniques like PCA that uh, lowers these, uh, dimensional, uh, these uh, dimensions of the data, uh, the result is in reality still uh, high dimensional. <coughs> uh, another example uh, is the robotics uh, down to the left part. And in the robotics field, uh, uh, collision detections uh, are of paramount importance in order to uh, 
are of, are of paramount importance. Uh, data sets of the robotics uh, uh, side of things tend to have uh, large dimensionalities since uh, its degree of freedom uh, uh, adds a new dimension to the data. So uh, we al already talked about uh, uh, nonlinear uh, non dimension reduction, but another example is uh, the one in the middle, uh, and uh, we already stated that uh, ARB can uh, benefit such cases. Uh, the last one is uh, the down uh, right one, the end body simulations, and uh, for um, high, high, feature, uh, high dimensionality features, uh, such as uh, three dimensions for time, uh, for space, sorry, and, uh, uh, velo uh, and accounting for velocities and accelerations, uh, we have a high dimensionality uh, data set. So in all cases, the high dimensionality is uh, noted and ARB uh, focuses on this and tries to solve uh, these kinds of problems. So there are several, several packages out there that uh, are doing similar tasks to ARB. Uh, that is, they partition space into regular bins and uh, uh, <clears throat> they, they partition space into regular bins. So some of these packages, the notable ones, are octtrees.jl, regiontrees.jl, parallelbarnshat.jl, and uh, collisiondetection.jl. Uh, so why use ARB then? Uh, so we have designed ARB to facilitate, as already stated, a high dimensionality data. And some of these packages either implicitly or explicitly uh, limit uh, their dimensions, uh, their, their input uh, data dimensions. Some also allocate prohibiting amounts of uh, memory for larger data sets and, uh, uh, larger dim and more dimensions. And uh, there is more potential in how we parallelize ARB. Uh, we also can, uh, through our uh, provide users with uh, more useful information, such as the queries uh, I mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, and ARB also enables uh, users to uh, define user-defined information and application-defined information to attach it on each uh, node of the tree in order to help data flow uh, between these nodes, uh, information flow between these nodes. We will see examples of this. So, so in this uh, figure, uh, we show how ARB scales. Uh, I, this uh, figure shows how ARB scales in terms of uh, number of dimensions per particle and number of particles uh, as well. Uh, ARB scales linearly in, uh, uh, with uh, the number of dimensions and it also scales linearly with uh, the number of uh, particles. Uh, <clears throat> so this also demonstrates uh, how we are able to uh, cater to more uh, dimensions uh, since the linear scaling. Uh, so the benchmarks we did uh, are up to uh, 30 dimensions and uh, 10 million particles. And to our knowledge, uh, ARB is the only package that uh, does regular spatial partitioning and binning. Uh, on such large uh, input uh, data sets, uh, uh, more than 20 dimensions. So in this one, we saw how the parallel implementation of uh, ARB uh, speeds up in comparison to the sequential one. So uh, using eight cores, uh, we can see we have up to uh, 7x uh, speed up. And note that these are pre preliminary benchmarks and uh, further tuning, uh, uh, we, and with further tuning we expect even better uh, results. All right. Uh, so, ARB partition space into d-dimensional cubes that offer geometric accuracy control. And it does that process up to L max levels of uh, partitioning. ARB also bins the corresponding particles into nodes and uh, uses uh, Pmax to control the maximum population for inner nodes, uh, that is for non-terminal nodes. Uh, so in the uh, graph to the right, 
uh, it is depicted a six dimensional uh, it, it is depicted six di dimensional particles with at most of uh, four levels of uh, partitioning uh, this is um, an array of projections and uh, each column and row uh, represents uh, a dimension uh, the figure also uh, emphasizes the ability of ARP to adapt to high dimensional data and uh, their density in that space. <clears throat> also, the total number of boxes will always be lower than 2n, where n is the number of particles, uh, and no empty boxes uh, will be registered. So in terms of memory, ARB allocates a small uh, multiple of the input data size in the beginning, and uh, each particle is uh, relocated to the corresponding bit and at runtime. Uh, so bin sizes are, are determined internally uh, in adaptation to the data density. All right, uh, coding, in, uh, coding in Julia made our lives really easy. Uh, so, using its multiple dispatches and the excellent package uh, abstract trees, we were able to implement simple functions uh, in order to get uh, iteration schemes that are otherwise harder to implement. Uh, we also take advantage of the dynamic type system, and uh, we don't limit ourselves to uh, one type, in, uh, single type implementation. And also, we utilize Julia's uh, 1.8 dynamic scheduler. Uh, and, it made, uh, and it played actually a major role in speeding up our code since the parallel implementation of ARB uh, spawns tasks that are not balanced. Uh, also, Julia enables us to port our parallel implementations to different platforms, and this is a point for future work. So, some examples uh, of how we use ARB. Uh, and the first one is the tree construction itself. And the tree construction accepts uh, an input matrix uh, X and uh, two uh, thresholds max L and max P. Uh, the ARP function gets to have an exclamation mark since uh, it permutes the input matrix, uh, but we offer this uh, permutation as a field uh, from the tree so users can permute uh, back to the original matrix. The third example uh, shows how population control uh, using MaxP at uh, non-terminal nodes works. Uh, and uh, that is that uh, non-terminal nodes should uh, have populations smaller or equal to MaxP at all times. Uh, the last one, uh, first uh, let's describe what centered side length is. Uh, it's, uh, its node spatially has a center and a side length. Uh, and all uh, points within that node must be contained uh, within that specified box. Uh, so this code snippet actually checks uh, if that is the case, which it is. <coughs> all right, so the next uh, a bit more interesting example is uh, how we find the center of mass uh, uh, for each node. This is assuming that uh, all points are unit mass. Uh, and uh, we iterate over all nodes, and uh, for, each, uh, for the leaf case, we compute the average of the points and the count of the points themselves as well. And we set it to the context of the node, which is the user context I already mentioned. So for the aggregate case, for the recursive case, let's say, uh, we iterate over the children of uh, the node, and uh, getting their context, we can perform aggregations uh, to get the complete result. Uh, we also set the context of that node as well to the result that we just uh, computed, and that's all. The post-order DFS uh, traversal is actually something that uh, abstract trees enable, enables us to do, and uh, we traverse the, the tree in a post-order uh, manner in order to make sure that uh, Children uh, nodes are visited first before their parents do. So they have their context computed. Another example is how we find uh, the nearest neighbor within uh, a search radius. Uh, so this is uh, not an iteration scheme, but rather it's a recursion. And uh, for the base case, for the leaf case, uh, we compute the pairwise distances of uh, all points to the query. Um, and we find the minimum of that. 
If uh, that minimum distance is within the search radius, then we return it and return the uh, index of the point, uh, rel um, the index of the point of that distance as well. So for the recursive case, we again uh, iterate over all children, but first we sort them uh, in terms of uh, their box distance to the query. Uh, we also filter out uh, some uh, uh, children that their box is, are not uh, in the search radius. For the rest uh, children, we search the tree recursively and update the radius and index as needed. <coughs> All right, so we talked about uh, the use cases of how we might use uh, ARB, and uh, we showed examples of how we actually use it. Uh, now we will take a look to the distinctive properties of ARB. Uh, there are two key processes, uh, spatial partitioning and spatial binning. Uh, the spatial partitioning process uh, refers to box creations based on uh, the maximum level, and uh, maximum particle uh, populations. So leaf boxes are either located to level uh, L max uh, or higher levels because they're of uh, because of low population. Because of low population. Uh, also note that empty boxes uh, are not registered. Uh, ARB does particle binning as well, meaning that uh, nodes are aware of uh, their content. Uh, and uh, we use Z uh, code or Morton order to encode each particle. And based on that uh, encoding, we uh, relocate the particles into the designated boxes, into their designated boxes. So there are two ways of actually doing the binning, of actually doing the particle binning. And the first one utilizes uh, a fixed recursion depth uh, and works better for uh, uh, uniformly distributed uh, data. Uh, the second one uses a variable recursion depth and uh, it does not assume the uh, data uh, distribution but rather it adapts to it and it also utilizes the ECP scheme that uh, I will present in uh, the next slide. <coughs> All right, uh, so before explaining the ECP scheme, uh, let's figure out what the uh, graph on the right is. Uh, so its uh, dark square is uh, considered to be one, uh, and its uh, blank spot is considered to be zero, so this is uh, binary information. Uh, its column is uh, a Morton code, and uh, Morton codes are computed by um, the, the part, uh, uh, by each particle in the tree, uh, by each particle in the input space. Uh, so the D by L uh, rows uh, that we have there uh, uh, is in terms of uh, D, the dimensionality of the input, and L uh, as in the uh, maximum uh, level of the tree. Uh, <coughs> so the first step of the ECP scheme uh, is E. Uh, which stands for encoding. So ARB encodes, as I said, each element to its corresponding Morton code, uh, resulting in this uh, D by L binary word for its particle. Um, the second step is counting, and ARB, uh, the second step is counting, and uh, ARB selects the D most significant uh, bits uh, depicted by the horizontal lines uh, in the graph. Uh, and it also counts uh, based on these uh, selected bits. Uh, after the count, this produces binaries for each distinct set of bits, uh, and this is depicted by the vertical lines. After we have uh, computed the boundary for uh, each distinct set of bits, uh, the P step of ECP uh, takes hold, uh, which stands for permuting. So ARB relocates all particles to their designated places uh, within their corresponding boundaries. Uh, so all elements with the same D significant bits are placed in consecutive uh, memory addresses, and this actually forms uh, subarrays that are uh, mutually exclusive from one another and can be worked in parallel in uh, later iterations of this process. So the actual last step of uh, ECP is uh, 
the repetition or uh, recursion. So we recurse for the C part and the P part by selecting the next the most significant uh, bytes in line and uh, permuting them in place only within the boundaries set by the previous iterations, by the previous uh, recursions. <coughs> so, uh, in this slide we explain how the control flow uh, works and how uh, we uh, do performance tuning for the ECP. Uh, there are two main control variables, the P2P and uh, P2S. P2P stands for uh, parallel to parallel and P2S stands for parallel to sequential. Uh, the P2P variable controls uh, whether or not uh, uh, parallel counting and parallel permuting uh, will be used, while the P2S controls uh, whether or not uh, tasks uh, for each subarray will be spawned in parallel or not. So if a, if a subarray that was formed by ECP uh, is not uh, big enough, uh, then uh, the overhead of uh, thread spawning is uh, greater than uh, the counting and permuting itself. So there is no benefit in using the parallel implementation for such problems. So in the end, uh, we conclude to uh, an implementation solution that utilizes a cascading scheme and problems that involve a really large uh, number of particles uh, will be counted and permuted in parallel, uh, while also the created subarrays will be further processed in parallel. Uh, smaller problems uh, may not utilize the parallel counting and uh, permuting, but they will spawn uh, threads for their subarrays. Uh, and even smaller problems just run sequentially uh, altogether, uh, not spawning uh, for uh, counting permutations or uh, their subarrays themselves. So the recursion stops either at the maximum level of the tree or when a uh, subarray is uh, so small, smaller than uh, the population threshold set in the beginning uh, where I explained the inputs max P and max L. <coughs> so a quick recap of uh, the whole thing. Uh, ARB accommodates uh, multi-resolution interactions with the geometric accuracy control. Uh, it is built in mind uh, of uh, it is built with uh, high dimensionality data in mind and it's conservative of its memory consumption uh, it utilizes the potential of multicore architectures uh, and uh, uses uh, julia's uh, abilities to adapt to abstract structures and, and data type uh, while also of course uh, utilizing the julia's dynamic scheduler introduced in uh, 1.8 so Thank you, Julia uh, Con 2023 for travel support. And also I would like to thank the co-chairs uh, of uh, uh, this year's uh, conference, uh, Ranzan and Logan. Thank you all for... Uh... Thank you very much for that. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, part of the n-body simulations as being one example. So yes. I guess in every time step in an n-body simulation, all the particles move a little bit. So let's say you have a, a tree that works for a set of particles and all the particles move a little. Are you able to quickly fix the tree or do you have to start from scratch? Uh, as of now, we have to, to, to start from scratch, but uh, the benefits of not uh, interacting with everyone in your space uh, really uh, beats every uh, performance uh, overhead that the tree construction might have. make this repair process faster than just starting from scratch? I don't uh, really know how to answer that since I don't uh, know, but uh, perhaps it's a, it's a point for further uh, uh, continuation of this package as well. So. Um, similar question is, if you have a set of points and then you have a new point you want to add, is there a way to add it to the data structure or do you have to redo? So there are plans of adding it to our uh, implementation. Uh, but as of now, we just have to compute the whole tree again. But there is a method. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, well, you can always, if if you are in your, well, if your if your new point is within the uh, maximum size of the rest of the points. So if it is uh, an inner point, you can always create a node, 
and uh, place it there or place it in an existing one. Uh, and if it's outside that uh, space, you can always uh, extend the tree structure upwards uh, in a fashion that uh, the, the old tree is just a branch of the new, bigger tree. I wanted to ask if you benchmarked it against anything else. Yes. So we, what are the results? Uh, we didn't want to really show the results of the other packages as well, uh, since we only wanted to uh, show how we fare, uh, not how we fare, uh, how, how we perform. Uh, but the benchmarks uh, were done and we, we had some uh, good results. Do you have anything specific in mind? Just uh, usually when you present an AdWord, it's nice to sort of compare it to other implementations. Yeah, we avoided that uh, because we don't, we, we wouldn't like to compare, let's say. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, we, we did the benchmark, we did not show them. Other questions? Okay, uh, let's talk. thank Antonis again. Our next speaker, uh, Lesio. So, yeah, I think you have ten minutes. Do you want eight? Do you want to leave two questions? Yes. Yeah, probably going to be probably nine minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to show some yeah. nine minutes and I'm showing you four minutes and minutes left. So, yeah. so, uh, so I welcome Alessio Bellisomi. That's vaguely correctly pronounced. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, and I think he's going to talk about cats. Uh, at least I hope so. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this presentation. When I when I talk about you uh, about you today is the pricing engine we developed for our insurance business at Dark Bermuda, and uh, the problem that we had to face and how Julia helped us out solving that. So, unfortunately, we're not going to talk about cats. So don't leave the room. But when when we talk about cat bonds, unfortunately, we don't talk about some feline actor from some old Hollywood movie. We're going to talk about Earthquake, we're going to talk about hurricanes. It uh, unfortunately comes with the privilege of being guests on this planet to be at some point eventually affected by one of these catastrophic events. And if it, it does might happen to you, you hope to have a good insurance. And also that everybody is okay. But they say that that's when the reinsurance plays a key role. Reinsurance is, on its basic terms, insurance for insurance companies is a risk transfer strategy that basically takes the risk away from the insurance company and brings it to third parties. And uh, this brings three benefits to you. Is number one, since the insurance takes less risks, um, you can have insurance, uh, insurance cheaper. So your premium for your policy is gonna be lower. And uh, the insurance company is gonna be able to write more business, so cover more people. And so this is gonna be a more uh, competitive market. And the third part is that the moment that you want to file your claim for a hurricane, by example, it's very unlikely you're going to be the only one. And so the amount of claims can eventually make the insurance company insolvent, bankrupted. So that's where reinsurance plays a great part. And uh, we go with an example. A uh, good friend of mine, his name is Faraz, is a chief risk officer for this insurance company. And uh, just before a board meeting, he realizes that he has a problem because year two and three on this graph, they've been very bad for the company. 
If he has something like that happening next year, the company is going to be in trouble. So he calls me out to say, Alessio, can you help me out with this? And I say, sure, Faraz. I can make you an offer you cannot refuse. So we set a threshold that above that, you're happy to retain the loss yourself. And uh, you give me 100 millions, and uh, I'm going to make some magic happen. I'm going to take and cover every loss on top of that threshold. This is how your historical loss will, like, will, look, will look, look like. And uh, you see the benefits on this year, but mostly at the same payout on the projected one, you have a much lower mean loss. That means that it's more predictable. You can stop the bleeding on your losses, and, the, and so the, the, you can present a more reliable budgeting plan. And you're going to look like a superstar at your board meetings. The guy is so happy, we decide to proceed. So we design a contract. And so first we identify what is the max loss that can occur to his portfolio, which is, say, let's say, everything gets destroyed. And let's say it's maybe like a one billion of losses. And uh, we set the threshold we set before for 200 million, and everything underneath is going to be retained by him. It's going to be called deductible. On top of that is going to be the limit that I'm going to help him out with my protection. And uh, this is going to be called 800 million in excess of 200 million. For every loss on top of, the, of that threshold, I'm going to take care of it. It's going to be calculated with this simple formula. So in this case, by example, we're going to split the $400 million loss. And uh, eventually, if he decides to write more business, we, he can build up a new layer on top of it. So these are two layers of a tower, or the reinsurance tower. And reinsurance is bid individually. Each one of them can be a separate contract. And uh, this is how real, real life contract would look like. So it's a bit more complicated, a bit more fancy, a bit more challenging. So once this is done, I go back to my office and see what actually is the portfolio that I'm building out with all of my contracts that I'm writing. And uh, so this is the contract that Faraz passed me up. And I see that running some projection. Year one, I will not incur in any loss because the loss here doesn't reach retention. But unfortunately, the other two years, not so lucky. Then there is a second contract that I already underwrote before. And I see that this one will bring in my portfolio $100 million loss on year one. And let's just focus on the green layers. And there's another contract here, very similar to the last one. These actually are very different because one is Florida Hurricane, the other one is Japanese Earthquake. And scientifically, we know there's no correlation between the two. This adds diversification in my portfolio. If you're aware of any relation between these two region perils, let me know. We're going to have a conversation. But uh, ARC comes over and writes a few metrics for understanding the quality of our portfolio. One of them is what is the max loss for each year. The second one is how much is the total loss that happens to me in every year of projection and the mean loss. And we do this one for each region pattern, which is a combination of the region and the risk that you're underwriting. Here, this one is very helpful because it tells us that, for example, 54% of our risk is in Florida. This, of course, is a very simplified uh, example. In reality, we work on uh, millions and millions of simulated loss. So the size and the complication is a bit bigger. And uh, now I have to find a way to price these things. Right? And this is the contrast you underwrite so far can be interpreted as a direct acyclic graph. And uh, you, have to, you have to be aware that there's lots of insurance company, lots of insurance company, like uh, and even ARC itself, my company, can buy reinsurance as well. And uh, this can create a very complicated graph. By example, this one are just uh, seven or eight programs in our portfolio. And they have to be, need to be priced in the right order from the outer contracts to the inner one because they all affect each other. And uh, the moment that we decide to buy reinsurance, protection or wealth for us, this, the complexity increases dramatically. And we are talking in a regular insurance portfolio, you have thousands of contracts, and tens of levels of session. And a graph like that would probably look like this. Oh, joking. But uh, going back to this graph, finally we talk a little bit about Julia, about Julia what it does do for us. Out of the distributed library, there is a dagger, which is a very great tool because it's able to understand the graph that we are trying to parse, 
and resolve it in the right order. He is able to saturate all, the, all our workers with work to do, and so relieves us to have to think about this one. In my company, it's a very small software team. We are two people. And so it's very important to dedicate most of the resources we have to solve business problem rather than technical problem. And this, for us, works great. And uh, finally, a little bit of code. I'll save you the pain to watch me writing it in front of the camera. And uh, going back to the graph that we had before, right? Um, there's a couple of here, uh, things to notice here. And initially, if you are used to the distributed library, this is not surprising because you have just like uh, the distribution of the function for all the workers. And uh, we have one function to define the pricing logic that we saw before, and uh, another one to combine in the final results. And uh, on this function here, we provide the losses as input, the financial terms, and uh, what happens here, and as soon as you call the spawn function, the macro, this gets passed immediately to the scheduler. It's like a, an async function that you usually have in your uh, uh, asynchronous code. And uh, the result of this, of this function are some uh, data type called tongue that you can pass to another other function. And basically, Dagger is going to be able to understand when this is completed, it's going to fire off the next function. So as we expected here, the combination function is going to give us, as a result, the total losses for what we expected so far. Now, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's assume that we buy our insurance contract. And uh, this will change its way. You will see that now the combination function has to wait for also the insurance contract to be completed after if it completed the parsing of these layers to price. And uh, of course, the final result is what to expect. This is a contract that provides $100 million reliefs for every losses on top of 250 million. So there's a few challenges we had to go through. Like, uh, ad there's a, a lot of data here we're talking about. We're like a messy simulation sets. We talk about like a 100 million maybe sim of uh, single events. So also the output are gonna be massive. And they're gonna, they're gonna be passed, data that have to be passed to other layer, other contracts. So all this chain, um, at the moment, of uh, data is not really well managed. Is not managed well through Dagger. There's the possibility to using threads, but that will limit some uh, scalability that we need. And uh, Julian, which is the maintainer of the Dagger library, promised me some big announcement tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully, this is going to be improving very soon. And uh, other things like uh, the we had to face some uh, file formats that are supposed to be easy to memory map. Things never work so well. Sometimes it's a problem with Windows. Sometimes it's probably just like a, a expectation. They are a match. And uh, something else that in our corporate environment works very well with Julia is that uh, um, our pressing engine is part of a web application. And um, people don't want to have, regular users don't want to have to wait for compilation time. It's not something they understand. And um, the package compiler help us creating um, executable that can be deployed through the, our DevOps process in their gapped environments. And uh, that, re that removes the, um, the pre-compilation time and uh, it works very well for our, our business process. And um, something else that Julia uh, did very well for us, when we start our adventure in uh, Arc, uh, we limit our uh, simulation to 10,000 years. At the moment that we had to pass to 50, 100,000 years, um, there's been a little, little, bit, little bit of hiccups, but Julia provide all the tools to profile your application and resolve the bottleneck, and that worked out great. So still, of course, a little bit of Windows support that here and there is a hit or miss, but overall, we're very happy with what we have so far. And uh, that's it. Thank you Tell me good. I think we'll quickly move on to the next speaker. So if Tristan is here, I hope. Yes? Yeah. Uh, if you have any question for Lesio, hopefully we'll be at my event the post session. We will appetize us as well at 6 p.m. Please don't miss that one. Uh, so, Tristan, how do you pronounce your second name? 
Uh, Carillon. Carillon. That thing uh, will uh, talk <laughs> about modeling with genie.jl. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, etc. And since uh, CBRO and CREX imply the release into the atmosphere of uh, hazardous materials, um, atmospheric dispersion models uh, can be helpful um, by predicting the sorry, impacted area. The mic. Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, atmospheric dispersion models can be helpful to. Uh, uh, but to predict the impact in the impacted area uh, before the such a release. Um, so since those models are supposed to be used in case of uh, emergency situations, we want them to be able to run fast and to, ru to uh, run them in the whole world and with a user-friendly interface uh, um, for such as people uh, who dozen are experts in the field can run them anyway. And um, another thing is that uh, the input for such atmospheric dispersion models uh, are uh, the atmospheric uh, weather state. Um, <clears throat> so we need a fast access to global weather forecast data. So to tackle all of these challenges, it has been decided to uh, build a web application on the European weather cloud, uh, so we are close to the meteorological data and we can have uh, fast access to global high quality weather forecasts. So the goal of this presentation is to uh, show you the technologies that have been chosen for uh, building this application and also to give some example of uh, how to use the API. Uh, but first I wanted to show you a small demo of uh, what the application looks like. So uh, that's one uh, flex part that you see here is one of the dispersion model that is implemented. And you can see how it's possible to plot the, the results for uh, several uh, time steps. So what you see here is the uh, concentration values, the spatial distribution of the concentration values. Uh, and it's really easy to plot them on an interactive map. So how uh, does all of this work? Um, the backbone of the application is um, the open, uh, the, the RESTful API description that is following the open API specifications. So basically, uh, that, that is specif specifications that tells uh, what uh, HTTP request the API should answer, as well as the, re the format of the response uh, that it should have and the format of the request payload. Uh, it also provides uh, a language uh, agnostic way of defining a data structure, so it's easy to communicate between the front end and the back end. The back end uh, so, uh, is, of course, implemented with Julia and more specifically, specifically with uh, the Genie uh, web framework. Uh, in the yellow bubbles, you can see all the most important dependencies uh, that are used. Uh, in the, in the app. Unfortunately, I won't have time to detail them. Um, so to translate the open API specification into Julia, we are using uh, openapi.gl. For the database, we are using Searchlight, uh, which is part of, the, of Genie as well. And for the graphical user interface, we are using uh, the Angular framework, so it makes, to, to make a single page application, as you could see. Uh, we are using the, G the leaflet JavaScript library for uh, handling the, the map features and uh, OpenStreetMap open street map for the map tiles. So um, to show you how the, the API can be used, I decided I, I picked some uh, some example. Um, so uh, we will use the, try to use the API to read one of the FlexPart uh, outputs. So FlexPart is the dispersion model uh, that, that I talked to, that I talked about uh, earlier. 
So Flexpart provides its output as netcdf files, which are a, f a file format, which is a file format to um, represent data cubes. So without going into the details, uh, the, the, this data format consists in layers, or uh, also called variables, that are defined on some dimensions. Uh, and you can also have metadata with it. So here, for example, uh, you have two layers, temperature and orography, that are uh, defined on uh, a set of the dimensions, so the longitude, latitude, and the time. In case of FlexPart output, uh, the file is much more furnished, but that's exactly the same principle. It's, it's always layers defined on some dimensions. So how to use the API to inspect and to read uh, those kind of data? Uh, the start would, is to look at the API documentation. So this has been generated with uh, swagui.gl, which is uh, part of the Genie ecosystem as well. So you can see that uh, if you make an HTTP request, a GET HTTP request uh, like this, you can get all the layers uh, or the variables that are available in some flex part output. So if we do that, so uh, here I'm sending the, the, the request to the API, and we can get, on the, on the right, you can see that we get the uh, spatial layers uh, of the FlexPart output. The one we are interested in is the second one, spec001 underscore MR, MR, because it's the um, uh, mass concentration that, uh, that uh, the FlexPart model has, pre has predicted. So now that we get the layer, we want to have the dimensions uh, on which it is defined. Uh, so this another, it is another API call where we get uh, all the dimension names with uh, their values. Uh, so we have the height, the x, so that's the longitude. And if you would go below, you would have the time and the latitude. Uh, and then, now that we know the dimension values that are available, we can uh, make another API call, a uh, post request this time, with the dimensions values that we are interested in. And so finally, we get uh, this GeoJSON uh, response. So I won't go into, into details, but basically, uh, it gives a, a series of polygons representing the grid cell. Um, and uh, the, prop the val properties, which is the value of the concentration on each grid cell. And you can also have the, uh, the outputs uh, as a GLT file. Um, as in the example that I show you, the demo, it's actually what's happening. Uh, the backend sends a GLT file, and it's, uh, it's uh, plotted on the map with a leaflet. So yeah, uh, that's it. I would have a lot more to tell about the application, but I don't have time. Um, all, all the code is open source, so you can go on this uh, GitHub repo, and uh, you can see a little bit more uh, uh, the code and uh, how uh, Julia was used uh, yeah, more precisely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions for Tristan. Uh, so is it easy to get access to all of this like, uh, type of weather data and integrate that into Julia? Well, no. <laughs> That's why, uh, no, actually, it's, uh, you have to pay for this data. Since uh, it's a collaboration with ECMWF, yeah. which is the institute producing this weather data, uh, I have access to them. But no, definitely, uh, it's uh, not easy to have access. That's why you can install the application. You can actually run it, but it won't function well because we won't have those uh, weather data. Um, it's also possible to have, uh, there are some data sets that are public in ECMWF. Uh, I, I could add some way of saying that we want to use public data sets, but uh, yeah, that's something that would be possible. But, uh, Thank you. Uh, well, oh, sorry. Uh, the UI in Angular. Yeah. Is there any specific reason why you chose this instead of <laughs> React or Vue? Or uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I, I was not. Uh, I'm not still not not an expert in web development. So uh, I struggled. Yeah, I had to choose at first uh, front end framework, and Angular is known to be quite opinionated. So. That means that you don't have to take too much decision yourselves about how to structure things. So. I like the idea because I don't have I, I didn't have experience. Uh, if I had to do it again, 
I don't know if I would choose uh, Angular again. I know that there is Velt now that, uh, that is gaining a, a lot of popularity, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Mm, I have a question. Uh, is Gini good for working with error observation data, like raster data? Yeah, actually, uh, all I didn't have time to, to specify, but uh, behind all these API requests that I was showing, uh, I'm using rasters.gl to read, to, so that to uh, abstract the netcdf files and to read the layers, and that's rasters, we, which is doing all the thing. So it was. So yeah, Julia was definitely uh, definitely a wise, uh, right choice for that kind of uh, application because of wasters and uh, all the geospatial uh, data uh, packages that are okay, existing. Yeah. If you try to use, uh, for example, Sentinel-5P data for this version model, uh, what uh, Sentinel-5P data? It's from the Copernicus program. Okay, and uh, these are weather forecast data? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, uh, the satellite... Uh, well, uh, for flex part, it only works with ECMWF data, also with WRF data, which is the American Institute, I think. But, but it, it, it doesn't work with any type of weather data because it's kind of complex. You have a lot of... Uh, fields that are needed for the dispersion model to run. But I, I intend to implement other dispersion model, more uh, uh, less complex dispersion model, which, is, which are called Gaussian dispersion model. And maybe with those ones, I could use any type of weather data. <coughs> yeah? Like, uh, do you also have the sleepover uh, that out? But like, have you considered just using the Yeah, yeah. The thing is that uh, from what I've seen, uh, so Stipple is nice for uh, kind of standard data-driven uh, web application. Here, there is it's not really suited because first you have this map uh, that I don't know exactly how to handle with Steeple. We have a lot of forms. Uh, I, I couldn't show all the apps, but there is much more. And you have so, yeah, it, it wasn't, it, I felt like it wasn't really suited for this case. Uh, <clears throat> and you have authentication, uh, yeah. When you say we do not have map support in Sorry? We, we don't have map support in Steeple. We do, oh, yeah? yeah, we do with plug -made maps. And also you can think we can do map box as well. With an uh, interactive leaflet map? Or yeah, yeah, I have, we have a demo of an interactive map where you can map around to uh, points of a city for the travel assessment problem. And uh, was it existing three years ago? No, no, it wasn't. Okay. That's why I didn't try it. But no, that's, that's good to know. The, problem that, that need, the code base is too large to go back to Steeple, I think, but uh, yeah, that's nice. Okay, do we have any final question? Uh, if not, we'll thank Tristan again. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone who came to this session uh, and all of the speakers as well. Uh, and yes, now there's one and a half hour. I think there might be some talking at the sessions, but nothing more here. Uh, unless I'm forgetting anyone waiting for a talk now. No? Good. Uh, but if nothing else, there's going to be the poster session uh, at 6 p.m. Cheers. <laughs>